involved in the negative. We'll now go to business of the Senate number two, standing in the name of Sen uh, Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number two, uh, proposing a reference to the Environment and Communications References Committee, be taken as formal. Uh, thank you, Senator Henderson. Um, uh, Sarah, uh, I believe that I called it one, but it is two. So, uh, is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, um, Madam President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunningham. Well, thank you, President. And um, Judas Iscariot was given 30 pieces of silver for betraying Jesus. And this is clearly one of the 30 pieces of silver that the Australian Greens are getting for supporting this ridiculous safeguard mechanism legislation, a stitch-up deal to get an inquiry up that otherwise they would oppose. This just further demonstrates exactly what's going on in these dark rooms with darkened windows filled with smoke where the Greens and Labor stitch up deals to set up committees like this one. I find it outrageous. And uh, look, we'll let it go through, but it's just another example of what happens in this brave new world of Labor Green government. Order. So the question is, order. So the question is that business of the Senate number two, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We now move to government business number one, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher. Senator Chisholm. It's that government business notice of motion number one, proposing a reference to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Chisholm. I move the motion and I table a statement in relation to the work. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher, uh, Senator Chisholm in the name of Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 201, standing in the name of Senator Bragg. Senator Bragg. Do I need to be in my seat? Yes, you do, oh, Senator Bragg. I need to just do a bit of a shimmy. Sorry. Thank you. Hello. Um, yes. How's it going? Oh, I see you all. Thanks a lot. We have you loud and clear, Senator Bragg. Please busy, busy, continue. Busy, busy, busy. Sorry, it's a lot of interjections here. It's hard to hear. Um, I, I, thank you. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion 201, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Bragg. Uh, thank you. I move that the following bill be introduced, a bill for an act to provide for the regulation of activities relating to digital assets and reporting in relation to central bank digital currencies and for related purposes. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Bagg be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Bragg. Could be. Senator Bragg. Keep going. Yep. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. So the question is the motion is moved by Senator Bragg be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to provide for the regulation of activities relating to digital assets and reporting in relation to central bank digital currencies and for related purposes. Senator Bragg. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to this bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Thank you. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Bray. We we'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 215, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion 215 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I'll call Senator Wish Wilson. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 215, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? 
I believe the ayes have it. We now move to general business notice of motion number 216, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. I ask the general business notice of motion 216 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Wish Wilson. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 216, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I'm going to put it again. Um, the question is that general business notice of motion number 216, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I believe that concludes formal motions. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day. Safeguard mechanism crediting amendment bill 2023 in committee of the whole. Yep, yep. Can I read this? Just to... Okay, Senators, uh, thank you. The committee is considering the safeguard mechanism crediting amendments bill 2023 and amendments 1 to 14 on sheet SK147, moved by Senator McAllister, who's seeking the call. Senator. Senator Waters, sorry. Much, Chair. Um, I've got a series of questions that I'm keen uh, to get some clarity on from the minister. So I'm just flagging that I've, I've got a line of questioning here that I'd love to be able to ask. Um, often we do each other the courtesy of, of allowing that. So, um, Minister, if I can sure. commence. Um, in relation to the supplementary explanatory man memorandum, which was circulated earlier today, can I take you to uh, paragraph three on page uh, 10? which states that the intent of the updated second object is to ensure facilities reduce their net emissions, end quote. The updated objects now also include what we have described as a hard cap, which is covered by um, subsection D. Could you please confirm that the intent of the cap in section 3, sub 2, sub D is for a real or gross emissions to be capped at the current five-year average and reduced over time. Sure. Sorry, Peter, it's really yes, hard to concentrate with you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Waters, for the question. Um, is my microphone on? Yes, it is yes. now. Um, you, thank you, Senator Waters, for the question. Um, yes, the intent is that net and gross emissions are reduced. So the government, as you know, has legislated our 2030 targets and these amendments in this bill before us now apply a proportionate share of those targets to the safeguard sector. This is a budget of 1,233 million tonnes of emissions from June 30th of June 2030, uh, sorry, 2020 to 30th of June 2030, and a single year amount of 100 megatons in 2030. Now these are net targets which include the use of offsets. We are also committed to reducing gross emissions overall from safeguard facilities tested on a five-year rolling average basis. And this bill is crucial to that task of reducing on-site emissions uh, as it creates safeguard mechanism credits. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Minister. Just on that rolling five-year average, can you advise me, please, what will the rolling five-year average figure be for the first financial year? And can you please provide an estimate um, of that amount? Minister. Thank you, Chair. So since the safeguards started, total safeguard emissions have risen by around 4 per cent. The current five-year average of annual emissions is around 140 megatons, noting that emissions have been down somewhat in recent years as a result of the pandemic. Senator Waters. Thank, uh, thanks, Minister. Can the Minister also please clarify the other parts of that same paragraph, uh, number three on page 10 of the supplementary explanatory memorandum, which state that in order to reduce the amount of aggregate emissions 
Changes to the rules shouldn't be made to reduce the number of designated facilities. Our understanding of that paragraph, and that's what I'm seeking your clarity on, Minister, is that making clear um, that the thresholds for facilities to be covered by the scheme from 100,000 tonnes shouldn't be raised to artificially remove facilities from the scheme, rather than changes to baselines or offsetting to reduce a facility's emissions. Is that correct? And can you um, provide an explanation of, of the intent of that paragraph? Minister. In broad terms, yes, that's correct. What we're saying here is that any attempt to adjust coverages, uh, to adjust coverage thresholds in the legislative rules for the scheme to show a reduction in total emissions from all covered facilities would not be consistent with the objects of the Act. The object is to reduce emissions from these facilities. It is not to exclude facilities by rule changes when those emissions would still occur in Australia and contribute to our national targets. So any rules that were made for such an improper purpose would not be consistent with the rulemaking test to be implied under the bill. Senator Waters. Thank you, Minister. That's, um, I'm grateful that our interpretation was a correct one. Uh, the proposed section 22XS uh, bracket 1 capital D close bracket little c states that the information provided to the secretary by an agency or authority of the commonwealth or a state or territory also needs to be considered can i just confirm what agencies that will include would it include for example state based environmental protection agencies nopsema or infrastructure australia yes sir Yes, NOPSEMA and other Commonwealth agencies and authorities would be covered, uh, as would state-based EPAs, and the department already engages with a range of Commonwealth, state and territory entities on future projects uh, and their emissions as part of collecting information for the government's inventory and projections. Senator Waters. Thank you. Minister, um, can I just move topics now? Can you provide a rough timeline of when you expect production factors and baselines for international best practices for new entrants to be rolled out? What time frame are we talking about here? Thank you, Senator Waters. Uh, we will consult by mid-2023 on guidelines for how international best practice values will be set and then consult on the setting of specific factors during the second half of 2023 with the aim of having best practice values set by the end of 2023. The guidelines will apply to all values and we will work with stakeholders to ensure that we've prioritised necessary values. This will include considering the likely entry of new facilities across safeguard sectors to ensure all values are in place for the required 2023-24 compliance year. Senator Waters. Minister, um, within the confines of those timeframes, uh, which ones will you be prioritising um, if you're able to, if, if you're in a position to tell me that? I think, Senator Waters, uh, the answer I've provided uh, provides a principle, which is that we would um, work with stakeholders to identify priorities and we would as part of that, we consider the likely entry of new facilities across safeguard sectors. Senator Waters. Okay, thanks, Minister. Um, when do you expect new lithium or iron ore projects to come on board, and how will you manage the triage process for international best practice standards? Minister, do you want some time? Yes. I'm just seeking advice yeah. on that. Latter specific sure. question. Okay. Thanks very much, and thank you for your patience in allowing me to seek advice. Uh, I think we expect that there may be uh, iron ore projects coming on in that 2023-24 compliance year, and lithium in the 24-25 compliance year. That is the advice at this stage, but as indicated, we would work with stakeholders and it may be that there is other or different information available to us. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Minister. Can I move now to um, offset methodologies with the pausing of the Human Induced Regeneration or HIR projects? How many existing projects does this affect? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Waters. Um, Senator, 
The government, as you know, is committed to implementing Recommendation 8 of the Independent Review of the Australian Carbon uh, Credit Units in full. Um, so that would be done by the Clean Energy Regulator, consistent with the review's recommendation that the CER should continue to be responsible for project monitoring, compliance and enforcement. Um, and where, as Professor Chubb noted in his recent statement, where projects do not meet the requirements of the method or of the scheme, the Clean Energy Regulator has the processes and the authority to act to make adjustments to projects, to re-stratify CEAs, to pause credits or to cancel projects. So Professor Chubb also noted in that statement that the CER can and does use existing professions, uh, sorry, provisions to address project non-compliance. Um, so the government will direct the Clean Energy Regulator not to issue future credits to human-induced regeneration projects until the regulator is satisfied the project complies with recommendation eight of the review. Uh, and the government will also direct the regulator to prioritise the integrity of these projects by appointing independent auditors in relation to H, uh, human induced regeneration project gateway reviews, and that would be under section 215 of the existing Act. Um, these checks would ensure that vegetation in the project area is growing as expected and is required by the method uh, and the CFI, Carbon Farming Initiative Rule. Um, so, Senator Waters, you asked how many existing projects this, is, this affects. Uh, as many as 371, but of course we have no reason to think that, uh, to, to believe that these projects aren't in compliance with the recommendation, uh, with the criteria set out in recommendation eight. But in a strict answer to your question, is 371. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Minister. I've got a series of more detailed questions that um, your head answer there sort of has alluded to some of. Um, how long do you expect that it will take for those projects to meet the higher standards laid down in the Chubb review, noting your um, commitment to implement Rec 8 there? Yeah, at the point where they sit. Senator Waters, uh, the way the scheme works at the moment is that a registered project, and uh, I hope that I have my terminology entirely correct, I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong, um, but a project approaches the CER at various points in time to seek crediting based on the activities that have been undertaken. Um, and so it's anticipated that that compliance check that we've been referring to in this most recent of exchanges would occur at that point in time. It's a little dependent, therefore, on the way that those project proponents come forward and approach the CER. Senator Waters. Okay, thank you. Uh, when will the updated HIR methodology be completed? Sen Senator Waters, I think this is a question of terminology, but the agreement is to implement um, recommendation eight of the Chubb review. Um, that doesn't ask for a revision of the methodology. It does provide guidance about how the method should be interpreted. Uh, and I think you'll know that the recommendation goes through three points. Uh, it says that the method should be interpreted as requiring evidence of a causal relationship between the nominated eligible HIR activity or activities and the dominant suppression mechanism that occurred through the entirety of the baseline period. Demonstration that these suppressors are directly addressed by the HIR activity or activities throughout the life of the project. And demonstration that the application of full CAM is consistent with these guidelines. So um, the process I've described, uh, we'll see those principles applied at the point in time that project proponents um, come to the Clean Energy Regulator uh, seeking to have their credits allocated. Senator Waters. Thank you. And just to clarify, I think you answered me this earlier, but does the minister have the power to counsel ineligible projects, um, or is that all up to the CER? Minister. Uh, my, sorry, 
chair. I didn't mean to Hello. get ahead of you. Um, I think our view would be that the Clean Energy Regulator can and does use existing provisions to address project non-compliance, and that is the approach we would expect. Uh, just before I give you the call, Senator Waters, I, I do intend to move around the chamber, but we'll, we'll stick with you for a little bit longer. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chair. Appreciate that. It is good to um, get these answered. Uh, sorry, just to clarify, though, does the minister technically have the power to do it? The Not minister. at the individual project level, level, Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Thanks, Chair. There's been accusations that the CER have misapplied the methodology and that HIR projects are occurring in places where um, even aged forests never existed um, or that weren't cleared. So how will the government ensure that the CER is acting to ensure the genuine integrity of ACUS rather than trying to protect its own reputation if it did in fact originally misapply the methodology? Minister. Senator Waters, recommendation eight of the Chubb review sets out some very clear expectations um, in relation to the CER's work. Um, it provides, I think, helpful guidance about the interpretation of the method and what would be required. Um, it also indicates that um, the CER should, as soon as feasible, include nominated suppression mechanisms and eligible HIR activities for new and existing projects on the project register. We are confident that the CER is in a position to implement the recommendation and we expect them to do so. Uh, Senator Waters. Thanks, Chair. Uh, ministerial directions to the CER, I understand, have to be general in nature under the Act. How will you ensure an integrity of assessment at the project level rather than that, that higher methodological level? Uh, thanks, Senator Waters. This is a question of governance. Um, we trust uh, the CER to undertake its work. We will provide, of course, the general direction about our expectations, but we do have confidence in the CER to implement these uh, recommendations at project level. Senator Waters. Thank you, Chair. Can I just indicate I've probably only got about five more minutes of questions, so if you were minded to um, permit me to yeah, finish to those, I'd be yeah, thank you. I didn't want to interrupt you, uh, but before you moved on to the next tranche, I might share the call, but if, you, if you've got five minutes, that's fine. All right. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, can I move now to the Powering the Regions Fund? And um, I note that its uh, specific use for safeguard facilities has been increased from 600 million to 1 billion. How much of this has already been allocated and to whom have those allocations been provided to? Minister. Uh, I'm advised that the uh, Safeguard Transformation Stream will provide dedicated funding for projects that reduce emissions at safeguard facilities that are tra trade exposed, but that has not started yet. So the answer to your <laughs> narrower question, which is, is none. Senator Waters. Thanks, Minister. Um, and will they be large grants or a series of smaller grants, or is that yet to be determined? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Um, so, the safeguard, perhaps I can provide some background about the safeguard transformation stream. Uh, it will provide dedicated funding for projects that reduce emissions at facilities that are trade exposed. It will support projects that reduce emissions uh, covered by the safeguard mechanism, i.e., the eligible facilities scope one emissions. It's intended to be technology and project neutral. It could support a range of project types like energy efficiency upgrades, shifts to lower carbon processes or fuel switching. And uh, funding through this stream would reduce the capital costs for safeguard facilities to invest in new low emission technologies and then fast track their adoption. Um, by reducing safeguard facilities covered emissions, it can reduce the ongoing cost for trade exposed facilities to meet their falling baselines. Um, as you have alluded to in your question 
and another $400 million has been announced for industries providing critical inputs to clean energy industries, uh, including steel, cement, lime and uh, aluminium and alumina. Um, there are no program guidelines yet established for these programs. They will be developed in the coming months uh, and the delivery vehicle will also be considered in the context of the budget. Senator Waters. Uh, thanks, Minister. Um, just in relation to the delivery vehicle, noting that you'll, you've said that will be um, considered in the context of the budget, I'm interested in whether it's been decided whether ARENA would receive any of this money to distribute or whether it will be run through the Grants Hub. Minister. Thanks, Chair. Um, you're right that ARENA already plays a very important role in innovation in renewable energy, electrification and energy efficiency, um, but as per my earlier answer, it's yet to be determined. Senator Waters. Uh, and Minister, can I just clarify whether the purpose will be to drive co-investment in upgrades using existing technologies or is it more to push the boundaries of um, commercial deployment? Minister. Thank you. And the answer is a mix dependent on the applicant and the circumstances um, they are facing. Uh, largely co-investment, but there may be circumstances when another approach is suitable. Senator Waters. Thank you, Chair. Um, my, just my final line of questioning. Something like 17 Hunter Valley coal mines are scheduled to close in the next decade, but it's anticipated that the vast majority of them will seek extensions of time, um, but possibly at lower rates of production. Most extensions are controlled actions under the EPBC Act um, when it's an expansion, but are extensions in time uh, this is what my question pertains to, uh, and given that they're extensions in time rather than in scope, and given that they're potentially likely to be lower scope one emissions than the 100,000 trigger, even though emissions from the whole project will still be over the trigger, I want to know how those coal mine time extensions will be treated by the uh, pollution trigger under the safeguard mechanism. Uh, thank you, Senator Waters. Um, if it is already a safeguard facility and an additional action is approved under the EPBC Act, which is likely to result in increased scope one emissions, uh, the minister responsible for the EPBC Act will provide, uh, it will notify that um, the, quanta, the nature of this change and the quantum relating to the action to the Minister for Climate Change, the Climate Change Secretary and the Climate Change Authority. And that would then allow each of those people or bodies to carry out their functions in relation to compliance with the emissions re requirements in the objects of the Act. Uh, just one point of clarification there. Thank you. I understand that process, but I'm interested in what will happen when the scenario is an extension of time of an existing facility, um, which will permit, uh, or rather, which would uh, emit uh, scope one uh, emissions below the threshold, despite applying to a project that is itself in accumulation above the threshold, ergo is covered by the safeguard mechanism. Given that that, um, I don't know how the EPBC Act would treat that because it's not an expansion in scope; it's an extension of time with a reduced production uh, output. So I'm interested in how those extensions would be treated by the, uh, you know, by the hard cap and by the pollution trigger in the safeguard mechanism. Minister. Senator Waters, I think it's difficult to answer that, uh, to provide a sort of clear response in relation to that scenario because it would be a little bit dependent on a number of things, including the nature of the, any regulatory interactions it had with the state EPA, perhaps or with uh, the Commonwealth um, under the EPBC Act. Um, if uh, it sounds like um, the, uh, it, it's, un it's sort of, I think it would be quite dependent on the circumstances that were before 
in your question, the Minister for the Environment at the time. Um, I'm happy to try and seek further information for you, but uh, it's a quite specific circumstance and I'll have to um, make inquiries. Last one. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Minister. Waters. Just gratefully take you up on that offer. I understand there'll be interactions with EPBC um, regulations there, and I don't already know the answer to that, so I'm grateful for you coming back to me uh, when you've got that information. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Waters. Uh, Senator Dunning. Uh, thanks, Chair. Before we were uh, interrupted by all of the other proceedings of the Senate, I asked a couple of questions around modelling and particularly around what analysis or modelling had been done on. Uh, the amendments that had been agreed to by the government or indeed introduced by the government as a result of the broad conversations that occurred in the uh, intervening period. and Obviously, I remain interested in understanding exactly what level of work and in-depth analysis and modelling has occurred because, as the minister said, a lot of work went into uh, developing uh, these policies and now these laws post-election. Uh, so it would be horrible to see this whole thing derailed by something that hasn't been analysed properly or thoroughly. Minister. Uh, thanks, Senator Janiam. Um, I think the pre uh, there is an underlying premise in your question that the amendments before the chamber today uh, substantially depart from the model that was presented earlier. In truth, uh, as we've been very clear about in our sort of public commentary on the process we were going through, we have been willing to take helpful suggestions that strengthen the policy intent um, and the implementation arrangements for the proposal we took forward. Uh, we think that the additional reforms that are before us today in the form of amendments are sensible. Uh, they provide you know, arrangements in relation to transparency and certainty in the operation of the mechanism. Uh, but the fundamental analysis is as I have already described to you. There was, as has been discussed at estimates and in the committee process for this bill, uh, some modelling work that was undertaken around opportunities for on-site abatement on facilities. Uh, there has also been a very broad consultation over a very long people, a period of time with a very broad range of people. And I do note that a broad coalition of business leaders and groups support the reforms, principally because they provide policy and investment certainty for large emitters. It's also the case, and it's been widely noted, that around 170 facilities already covered by the safeguard mechanism are already covered by net zero commitments that they have made in response to other um, drivers in their business. That represents 86 per cent of scheme emissions uh, and a third of the publicly listed companies that own safeguard facilities use an internal carbon price for investment decisions, uh, with half using a price of more than $100 a tonne. So, these things are already part of business decision making, and the feedback that we have uh, has been overwhelmingly supportive, uh, overwhelmingly supportive of the approach. And in part, that is because the proposed reforms have been designed to provide sufficient flexibility to moderate and, and mitigate any cost impact. Um, I point to three features of the scheme: the hybrid approach to setting baselines moderates the initial scheme impact. Um, while encouraging production to occur where it's less emissions intensive and that lowers the overall economy-wide cost. There are flexible compliance options including borrowing, multi-year monitoring and the use of domestic offsets which will help safeguard facilities meet their obligations at a lower cost. And As we have just been discussing in relation to the Powering the Regions Fund, assistance will be available to help businesses that are not competitively disadvantaged, uh, to ensure that businesses are not competitively disadvantaged. Um, Perhaps I can make this final point also, Senator Dunningham. There are costs that arise from inaction, uh, and so without a credible domestic policy to reduce industrial emissions, Australia's exports may increasingly be subject to import tariffs or to carbon border adjustments imposed by our trade partners. Uh, and as I think uh, former Treasurer Frydenberg um, said rather publicly, Australian businesses may also face increased capital costs in an environment where global financial institutions and decision makers uh, are taking coordinated steps to align investment with the transition to net zero. Senator Dunham. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, look, uh, I appreciate that uh, response, although whether changes are significant or small, this is a significant piece of legislation which will have significant impacts on the economy. If we are to take the government at their word, it's uh, changing the entire landscape here and providing certainty, etc. Et to that end, um, I, I just would like to understand, beyond what had been done for the existing legislation, the consultation and analysis that you have referred to, uh, surely the government has sought to understand what impact the changes, be they large or small, will have on business so that they can provide that certainty. We received the amendments this morning and the explanatory memo or the supplementary explanatory memorandum. So on that basis, my question to satisfy myself that what you're saying is it'll be all okay is correct. I would be interested in what modelling has happened. You also referred to the cost of not doing anything. Has there been any analysis or quantification of those costs with regard to CBAMs or other import tariffs. Have you got any examples of the costs that might be imposed to any particular industry that you could enlighten us with? Um, in my answer just now, oh, my apologies, Chair, I should have waited for the call. Sorry. Thanks. Uh, Senator Dunham, in my answer just now, I stepped through the approach that the government has taken. There has been um, some modelling undertaken uh, internally between the Department and the Treasury. There has been a design process which has sought to provide flexibility to mitigate the cost impacts. There has been wide consultation um, to properly understand businesses' uh, circumstances and the way that the proposal would impact uh, would interact with existing businesses covered by the mechanism. Uh, and as I've indicated, there are potentially costs of inaction. Uh, they were alluded to by a former treasurer in a government that you were part of. Uh, if I have any specific information about that, I'll, I, I will provide it to you. But it, I think, is certainly the case that there is a global move towards investors making quite substantial requirements in relation to uh, decarbonisation, and Australian businesses are not immune from that. Senator Dunning. Thank you, Chair. Look, um, I appreciate that. What you did step us through was all of the work to the uh, completion of the bill as it was presented prior to any changes, and I appreciate that. And I've uh, talked about the fact that that appears to be a very in-depth and thorough process. What I was asking about was everything from that point in time to the end product. The changes we have here that have been asked about by the Greens, I think you're telling me that because in the government's mm -hmm. opinion they're not significant departures from what was there, there has been no modelling undertaken. Um, I would also be interested, in light of that, you, you said uh, so no capacity to provide information around costs born out of modelling or analysis to businesses relating to any of the changes to the bills that have, the bill rather that have been brought forward through these negotiations. Uh, just to have that compare and contrast, the cost of inaction, you referred to former Treasurer Frydenberg's contribution to the public debate on this. Well, what are those figures? Because I mean it, it should be a like for like sort of um, thing, uh, particularly with the various uh, international agreements we're reaching, um, uh, trade arrangements. There must be some capacity for you to step us through what the cost of not doing something is compared to doing what this bill proposes to do. Senator McAllister. Uh, Senator Dunham, I think I have largely answered most of the questions that you've just put to me again, and I don't think I can add to the answers I've already provided. I will draw your attention to the government's decision to initiate um, a review to examine um, CBAM arrangements. Um, it's precisely because we need this sort of information to make good public policy decisions in the Australian context. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, if you could just confirm, uh, I know Senator Dunningham's asked something similar, but and you have gone through a timeline, so you might just be able to do this quickly. When did the government commence consultation on the safeguard mechanism reforms? I know you ran through a timeline before, but Minister. 
Um, Senator Hughes, I have run through this before, and I'm not sure what the value is of asking me questions that I've already answered in the committee. Senator Hughes. Chair, I'll consult with Senator Dunningham. I just, I guess, I want to know if the consultation is continuing, even though the safeguard mechanism crediting bill has already been put through the House of Representatives, and the fact that we only got the amendments this morning. Minister. Uh, Senator, the government is in very regular communication with business about a whole range of matters, and I don't expect that to change. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Chair. So, um, Minister, perhaps you could inform us sort of what are the issues that businesses are raising in these consultations with particular reference to the safeguard mechanism? Minister. Senator, I'm not going to. Run, I mean, it's simply not possible to run through all of the matters that are canvassed um, between departments um, and with uh, and between business. However, I can point you to some of the public information that business has provided. So, for example, the Business Council of Australia has said that additional support for trade-exposed businesses and workers as well as critical sovereign capabilities is a crucial step that will help save jobs and ensure Australian businesses are competing on the global stage. As designed, the safeguard mechanism and its baseline targets are tough but achievable. Australia needs a credible, durable framework to reach its climate targets and grow the economy. Um, the AI group says the treatment of new facilities appears to strike a workable balance providing pathways for new projects that stack up to go ahead without adding to burdens on existing facilities or threatening national emissions goals. And in terms of the investor group on climate change, uh, they have indicated that the reforms will help unlock investment in the new and existing industries that will maximise Australia's competitive advantages in a net zero world. Um, some in the, they're obviously sort of um, peak bodies. Uh, BP has said this. BP reaffirms its support for reforms to the safeguard mechanism to provide incentives for large emitters to reduce their emissions in support of Australia's emission reduction targets. We support the goals of the 2015 Paris Agreement on climate change and believe ambitious climate policies like the safeguard mechanism reforms will be essential to enable the world and Australia to meet these goals. We look forward to working with the government as the reforms are finalised. Uh, Rio Tinto indicates that they say this. Rio Tinto supports the use of a reformed safeguard mechanism as part of a suite of policy measures to incentivise genuine industrial abatement. Um, the Aluminium Council says that the focus for policy design for the safeguard mechanism should be on establishing a framework to maintain industry, jobs and competitiveness while also decarbonising yes. through the period to 2030 and beyond to achieve net zero by 2050. The success of this policy will not be measured in 2030 alone, but in the transformation of Australia's industry in the biggest clean industrial and economic revolution this country has seen. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, just with regards to specific businesses as opposed to industry associations or groups, um, have any specific of the 215 businesses indicated that they cannot achieve the imposed 4.9 per cent annual reduction to emissions baseline, so specific companies? Minister. Implicit in your question, Senator Hughes, is uh, an expectation that all businesses will be required to reduce by 4.9 per cent. And, uh, uh, amongst, uh, we've been through a long process of consultation, and amongst the changes that Minister Bowen announced recently were uh, changes to the threshold that would allow emissions-intensive trade-exposed industries to access a, uh, how shall I characterise it, a, a less ambitious decline pathway. Uh, in recognition of their significance and the challenges for those businesses in meeting in meeting that pathway. So sorry, sorry, Chair. Um, so, Minister, just maybe for my benefit, 
have any businesses suggested that they will not be able to achieve the emissions reduction that's being set for them, even if it is less than 4.9? Are they struggling? And have they said to you that they will struggle to achieve that, uh, regardless of what the, the figure is? The, the figure that you will set for them, will that be struggled to be achieved? Minister. Uh, Senator Hughes, as I've indicated, the changes announced by Minister Bowen um, just a couple of days ago were in response to representations, particularly from the manufacturing sector. Um, and those changes uh, uh, involve a number of things, the, the most significant of which perhaps is a change to the test that applies to establish um, whether or not they are requiring some kind of concession in the targets that are applied to them. Uh, it is an example of the consultation process uh, working through the issues. We're very determined to truly understand the businesses that are covered within the safeguard mechanism. One feature of this mechanism is that it does cover hard to abate sectors and it needs to be designed in such a way as to provide incentives for those sectors to um, start the transformation that's critical for their long-term competitiveness, but also in recognition of the, you know, the, the technologies that are available to them at this point in time. Senator Hughes. Yeah, um, we might keep moving on, but if I can just point out, I, I sort of did ask for specific businesses rather than sectors or industry groups or associations or anyone representing manufacturing, mining, etc any specific businesses, so perhaps you can come back to us if there are any specific businesses that have suggested they will struggle to meet whatever the, is the imposed figure for them to reduce emissions by. Um, again, Senator Dunny and I asked some questions this morning around modelling that had been conducted and commissioned. Um, and I noticed that you said that Treasury had done no modelling of economy-wide impact of this policy. Um, who did what modelling on what where? So if Treasury didn't do it on industry-wide or economy-wide, what without giving us the modelling, what modelling has been done and by whom? Minister. Um, Senator Hughes, I have answered this already on several occasions during this debate. It's also been answered in estimates and it has also been answered during the committee inquiry into this bill. So I'm going to repeat it, but I think it is I know that you were present in the discussions of this on previous occasions, so I'll repeat the answer for you on this occasion, but I do question your motivation in continuing to ask. Senator Hughes. Sorry, I can just help clarify. I, I have been in estimates and I've been here, and what we've been told is who hasn't done modelling on what specifically. We still don't know what modelling has been done, by who, on what. Any question we ask, has Treasury done modelling on what the impact's going to be on GDP? Has Treasury done impact on what job losses may occur? Has any modelling been done by anyone, DQ, Treasury? All have said no. So what I'm trying to understand, we've been told what modelling hasn't been done. I'm trying to understand what modelling has been done because we have not been told anything in the affirmative, only who hasn't done what. Minister. Senator, that just is incorrect, but I'll tell you again. Um, so as I indicated earlier to Senator Dunningham, economy-wide modelling was not undertaken. The Treasury and Department jointly undertook analysis of the potential for on-site abatement at safeguard facilities and implications for the domestic carbon market. Senator Dunham. Yeah, thanks. Uh, look, um, the, yeah, the points were made about what we don't know, so we'll just move on from that and hope that uh, things aren't as bad as we predict they will be. And I'll come to some of the comments of some of the groups out there that are expressing fear about this in a moment. But uh, I was interested just on this issue of modelling around uh, analysis for demand for ACUs. Um, and while we're thinking about that, uh, um, I'd also be interested in how the carbon price being set here 
in this legislation compares to the carbon price that Australia's trading partners have, uh, and as well as the carbon price in other developed nations. And just on that, though, I mean, I think it's important to put on record some of the comments that have been made by uh, entities like the Australian Pipelines and Gas Association, the Chief Executive Steve Davis, who said. There are questions over whether the flow-on effects of any additional restrictions on gas supply will be borne by Australian households and businesses who are already facing major increases to energy bills due to the transition. The uh, CEO of uh, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Andrew McKellar, um, said that the fundamental test for the safeguard mechanism is whether it supplies secure and affordable energy for households and businesses, uh, and pointed to the fact that as he said, AMO already expects a shortfall, which will only worsen if new gas production doesn't progress. The fact of the matter is that gas will be essential to our energy system in the years ahead, but there's a risk that energy supply will be choked off before alternative sources are available, threatening reliability and driving up electricity prices. So, look, I've got a range more. I'm sure I'll be able to put on record before we conclude debate on this bill. Uh, but these are the reasons we're asking these questions, seeking certainty. It's not for no reason for spurious political games. It is because there are entities, individuals, businesses, households, communities, all who have concerns about what this could mean. So I asked two questions just before. Analysis for demand of ACUs and, of course, uh, what or how does our proposed price compare to the price of Australia's trading partners and other developed nations? Minister. Uh, I've indicated to you that the Department and Treasury jointly undertook analysis on the potential for on-site abatement and implications for the domestic carbon market, and we have spoken at length about the fact that that analysis is cabinet and confidence. Um, it is also price-sensitive information because the Commonwealth is the largest purchaser of ACUs, uh, and this is a matter that has been canvassed. Um, on many occasions. Um, in relation to trading partners and pricing, um, look, I don't know that I have pricing before me, um, but it is the case that many of our trading partners are on a similar journey to us. Um, and uh, I will see what I have um, before me, but I, I just Sorry, Senator. You have the call, Minister. Senator Dunning, yeah, yeah. in the period while the Minister seeks that information, which I think is quite important for Australia to understand how we stand in this internationally competitive, globally competitive market. Uh, when it comes to carbon, are we pricing ourselves out of the market? Are we making it more expensive for business to operate here because we've set a price higher than others? So I thought the minister might be able to tell us that pretty straightforward information when it comes to our trading partners. So perhaps now that you've had a bit of time, you might be able to give me a dollar figure or a couple of examples. Um, because I was impressed with the uh, clarity and uh, straightforward ability to answer Senator Waters' questions. So perhaps uh, we might have the same here. Minister. Um, look, I'm advised that the European price is $145 um, dollars, Australian dollars. Um, I was looking for some additional information, which I do know is in my folder somewhere, just in the depths of it, and it runs through a range of obligations that um, have been adopted by many of the countries that we trade with. And when I find it, I'll let you know. Sir Dunning. Sorry, Chair. We're a little excited. I know you will, uh, Minister, so I'll happily receive that when it comes through because it is an important part of the consideration here. We operate as part of a global economy. We have global environmental obligations, and I want to make sure that uh, moving forward what we do actually fits in and doesn't uh, unfairly penalise us. Um, on that basis, uh, as you look for a bit more of that information, I just wonder if you might be able to enlighten the Senate as to how the $75 price cap was determined and what role DQ had in setting that price, uh, whether, and I think the answer might be yes to this, but was there a direct consultation between um, Treasury and DQ on the setting of the $75 
carbon price. And uh, if on that we might look to explain the difference between the price outlined in the Powering Australia policy document and where the government has landed uh, with what is proposed here. Minister. So, as I've indicated, the Treasury undertook modelling with the department to understand the likely impact on the carbon market, and that informed a range of features of the design. Um, the current market price, I think, is around the between $37 for an ACU. Um, we anticipate we you know, the government considered that $75 represented a reasonable price cap. Business certainly was keen to see some kind of cost containment measure, um, and this was the figure that was arrived at. Senator Dunning. Uh, so, Minister, just to clarify, you're saying it's the modelling that is subject to cabinet in confidence and contains market sensitive information that informed the price cap and therefore you can give us no further information. Is that what I'm to believe you're saying? There Minister. Are, um, yes, thank you, Chair. There are a range of inputs to this, including the consultation process we went through. We've stepped through that uh, extensively um, and other forms of analysis that uh, were put before the government and ultimately this was a decision of government. Senator Dunning. Thank you. And on that basis, it being a decision of government, I just I wonder if a range of processes, a range of inputs, the consultation, and it's a pretty significant decision to reach. Um, what role did DQ have in setting this price was a question I asked before. Minister. Oh, DQ provides advice to the minister. Senator Dunning. Um, look, I'll just uh, accept that. Can we then just look to the uh, penalty, the dollar amount for the penalty? for emissions over the baseline, which I understand to be $275 a tonne. Could I ask how that figure was arrived at? Minister. Uh, well, the existing scheme that operated under your government also has a penalty for non-compliance, and it's linked to the uh, standard penalty units that are present in the Commonwealth framework. Um, and. Uh, Essentially, the um, penalty is a penalty that would be paid for non-compliance. Most businesses, we expect, will want to comply, and the cost containment measure um, is a far more likely pathway for a business that is um, seeking uh, that is seeking to avail itself of accused for compliance than than the penalty. However, it is important that a penalty for non-compliance exists. Um, and I will note, however, that the safeguard mechanism so far has had 100 per cent compliance. Senator uh, Thank you, Chair. Uh, th there are some significant differences between what's in place now and um, what's proposed here, particularly with regard to penalties and non-compliance and uh, enforced baselines. So uh, how is the 275 that's proposed linked to what's in place now? Minister. You might need to just clarify the question. Um, what is it that you're seeking to understand? Senator Dunning. Thanks, Chair. Uh, my original question was how we determined the $275 penalty or how the government determined and has proceeded with that. In answer, your first answer to me, you indicated that there are penalties in place now um, and, there, and so somehow well, I inferred that there was some link between what's in place now and what's proposed, so I was just seeking to explore that point. Minister. Uh, right, I understand. So it's not so much that it's linked to, but how does it compare with the existing arrangements? Uh, okay. So um, essentially the bill updates the arrangements for a civil penalty that facility would incur if its net emissions were higher than permitted. So that would be described as an excess emissions situation. And 
you know, as you'd understand, excess emissions could impact our climate outcomes. So the penalty should be proportional both to the length of delay in meeting requirements and, importantly, the quantity of excess emissions. Um, previously, the penalty for an excess emissions situation only depended on the duration, not the relevant quantity. Senator Daniel. Uh, do you know, Minister, what the current penalty rate is for non-compliance? Minister. Uh, a penalty unit um, is, at the time the bill was introduced, was $222, and in November 2022 the Parliament passed the Crimes Amendment Penalty Unit Bill, which updated the value of a penalty unit from uh, to $275 from 1 January 2023. So the maximum civil penalty will be set at one penalty unit per tonne of excess emissions every year. Um, I am trying to seek information about the. Oh, right. <laughs> and uh, staff very helpfully um, point out that this is set out in the EM. Um, so it differs to the existing penalty that is set out in the Envious Regulation, which for a non individual is 100 penalty units for each day in an excess emission situation up to a maximum of 10,000 penalty units. For an individual, the existing penalty is 20 per cent of this amount, um, noting that no uh, covered facilities are individuals. Um, in all, there needs to be a degree of proportionality between the seriousness of the contravention and the quantum of the penalty. Uh, I've explained that, and so the level of uh, the maximum penalty being set at one penalty unit per tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent of excess emissions is intended to be commensurate with the adverse economic impacts of climate change now and in the future. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Senator. I'd be interested to know if, uh, the, if a facility exceeds its baseline, can't access ACUs or S and certainly won't be in possession of SMCs, they then have to pay a penalty. Um, does the payment of that penalty um, extinguish any uh, liability for being over the baseline in perpetuity, or is it for that calendar year, or does it not do that at all? They, they remain um, in a position where they need to rectify this by meeting the baseline in breach. The Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Dunningham. I, I think that question misunderstands the far more likely choice of a business that found itself in that scenario, a business that was unable to meet its baseline and was unable to secure ACUs in the private market under the cost containment measure would secure ACUs um, from the government at that cost containment cap of $75. Senator Dunningham. Thanks, Chair. So there is a guarantee that no business will ever be in a situation where they can't access uh, ACUs under this cost containment measure? Minister. Uh, the government intends to make available um, ACUs at that, um, at that price, um, and that is set out in the, in the rules, and will be set out in the rules. Senator Dunningham. So I'm just trying to understand this. So a business that, uh, you know, obviously I agree with you, no business wants to just continue to be in a situation where they're exposed to such a liability. Uh, the penalty being $275 per tonne per year, if they can't a access ACUs in the ordinary way, you're saying there is a facility available through the cost containment measure, through the government's ACUs, if I understand correctly, and, and on that basis, no business will ever face the penalty. Is that right? Minister. I don't wish to speculate on all of the circumstances, but you can imagine a circumstance where a business willfully did not comply. And under those circumstances, for whatever reason, they might not seek to access the cost containment measure. It would be important that a penalty was in place for such non-compliance. Senator Daniam. Uh, thank you, Chair. That sounds to me that there's almost an intent component in the assessment of whether a penalty is applied or not, um, uh, because we talked about willful uh, non-compliance with the baseline. 
I, I, my simple understanding of this was a business is in breach because they can't meet the baseline, the 4.9 per cent per year through to 2030. They can't access offsets because the market may not have them available. The new piece of information to my mind was that the government was going to make available capacity to cover any business that can't find them elsewhere, which to my mind says that there will be no one paying the penalty unless, and you said willfully in breach, uh, which talks to almost some sort of criminal mental intent. So if you could just explain that, I'd be help, uh, grateful. The Minister. Senator, Dun Senator Dunningham, I was trying to provide a plain example of the circumstances that you described and how that might come about. Um, Ultimately, a decision about whether to find a business in breach would be a decision for the regulator and they would step through a series of processes. However, to date, compliance with the safeguard mechanism has been 100 per cent. It's not our expectation that covered facilities or covered entities uh, wish to do anything else but comply. Um, all of the design features of the scheme are designed in close consultation with the regulated community to create the circumstances where they can comply. And the cost containment measure is part of that, as are the borrowing arrangements that would allow um, an entity to borrow some of their uh, future um, entitlements within the five-year period, and also the trading arrangements, which would allow them to purchase safeguard credits from other participants in the safeguard mechanism. Senator Daniam. Thanks, Chair. Um, just with regard, to, has Treasury uh, made any estimations, or are they, as part of the budget process, around how much revenue might be obtained through this penalty um, arrangement? The Minister. Uh, the assessment is none, because, as I have indicated to you, the historical experience is that there has been 100 per cent compliance. I do have some additional information about how a penalty would be imposed in a more technical way. Um, it is not an automatic penalty. It is the maximum penalty that can be imposed by a court, and the amount of any penalty imposed would be decided by the court, taking into account relevant matters prescribed by subsection 31.4 of the INGAS Act, including the nature and extent of the controversy the contravention, the circumstances in which the contravention took place and whether the person has previously been found by the court in proceedings under this Act to have engaged in any similar conduct. Senator Daniam. Uh, thank you, Chair. So there's a degree of discretion. Obviously, there's a framework for decision-making for the regulator to view these matters through and they step through a decision-making process. But uh, So you're telling me it's not a, you're in breach? and you can't get your offsets one way or the other, you don't automatically get a penalty. So that, that is an important difference. I wasn't aware of that. So, um, and, and we're projecting no revenue because based purely on historical or because we believe the framework for decision-making will ameliorate the need to impose penalties in the future? The Minister. The way that you framed that circumstance doesn't accurately reflect the options that are available to a, a scheme participant. Um, the cost containment measure means that if it was not possible for that business, for whatever reason, to find um, ACUs in a market environment, they would be able to purchase them from the government. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Chair. Okay, well, look, I'll, uh, I'm sure I might have a bit more on that, and I'm sure Senator Hughes probably does as well. Uh, down the track. Um, just in terms of the industries and sectors that are hard to abate, uh, is there a prescriptive or a prescribed list of industries or is, it, uh, is there some sort of methodology that sets out a threshold by which they can then be included as hard to abate? Uh, I'm just interested in who is included in what's now got concessions and carve-outs.
The Minister. Um, Senator Daniam, I think perhaps if I can answer your question in a slightly different way. Um, the scheme contemplates um, trade exposed um, entities. It also covers trade exposed and it contemplates trade exposed entities that are baseline adjusted. Um, and those, whether or not an entity qualifies for that second category is dependent on the extent to which the costs associated with compliance, uh, how they, how they um, what proportion those costs are of either um, for, a, for all businesses, their revenue, or for manufacturing businesses, their EBIT. And that second pathway was the change to the proposed rules that was announced on Monday as a consequence of the consultation that's been going on for many months uh, with industry. Senator Daniam. Uh, thanks, Chair. So trade exposed and they so trade exposed industries would include cement, I presume. So could you just list for me the trade exposed industries we're dealing with? If the government has a list of either by facility um, or by sector industry would be helpful. The Minister. Senator Daniel, I'm advised that it is listed in the draft rules and is expressed as part of the production variable. Senator Daniel. Um, I just wonder where one can obtain draft rules from. The Minister. They were released in January, Senator Dunningham. Um, along with the consultation paper that describes the effect of those rules. Senator Dunningham. Sorry, thanks, Chair. Are you able to table that for me? Uh, I don't have a copy here and um, we don't have that long. Or you could read them out if there are not many. Senator Dunningham. Uh, Minister. Jeez, Chair, sorry to get ahead of you. Um, Senator Dunningham, they are on the internet. I have Googled them on more than one occasion myself. Uh, this is just one page from a quite lengthy document, so I'm not sure that it will really assist you in the way that you hope. Senator Daniam. Sure, okay, so I can guess them. I've got my staff Googling it for me now. So cement, aluminium, steel are included? The Minister. Cement, aluminium and steel are included. Senator Daniam. Is fertiliser uh, manufacturing included? Minister. Uh, ammonium nitrate is included. Senator Dunningham. Um, how many more on that list? <laughs> the Do you know, Senator Dunningham, it is on this page 32. <clears throat> Senator Dunningham. So they're the draft rules. Uh, uh, but I understand there is more on the following page and extends to 65 in total. Senator Dunningham. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I will be in possession of that list shortly, I'm sure, um, which is helpful. I don't know where I was in January, probably on holiday. But we're not now, and we'll be going through this in some detail. So there's 32 industries. No. 60 something. Minister. Um, <laughs> Senator, as I indicated, I failed to turn the page. There are 63 um, production variables that are indicated as trade exposed in Schedule 2. Senator Daniam. Okay, and thank you for that. So that's the draft rules. Um, is it projected that any will come on or go off uh, as part of what has been happening to this point? Minister. Um, no, but as a consequence of the change announced by um, Minister Bowen earlier in the week, um, there will be additional information provided to define those trade-exposed activities 
that are defined as manufacturing activities and it's that category that allows that will allow those activities to have or those entities to have access to um, the differentiated test um, for whether or not they uh, sh should be eligible for uh, an adjustment to their baseline. Senator Daniam. Thank you. And so uh, I'd be interested to know what the differentiated test actually involves, if you could run me through that. And then the end <coughs> result, the adjusted baseline, is that a subjective as in, is it going to be assessed on a case by case, or is once you meet this test, you then get an adjusted baseline, which is X percent as opposed to 4.9? The Minister. Uh, so you asked two questions, I think, there, Senator Dunningham. Um, so uh, trade exposed baseline adjusted. Uh, uh, perhaps I can take you through all of it. Uh, so it is the subset of trade exposed facilities that can demonstrate that the costs are above a specified threshold. So facilities will have a different framework depending on whether the facility is manufacturing or non-manufacturing, which is why I made reference to the need to uh, make such a determination in the rule. Um, that differential treatment between manufacturing and non-manufacturing reflects stakeholder feedback on the differences between the two in terms of their margins and their capital intensity. So for non-manufacturing, the proposed threshold will be based on scheme cost as a percentage of facility revenue. As I indicated, for manufacturing, the proposed threshold will be based on scheme cost as a percentage of facility EBIT. Um, and that just simply reflects the differences in the way that these businesses are organised. Um, either way, trade exposed baseline adjusted facilities can apply for a lower baseline decline rate. Um, the policy rationale for that is that these facilities face concentrated impacts under the scheme and present a genuine risk of carbon leakage. And so the minimum baseline reduction for non-manufacturing activities will be 2 per cent and it will be 1 per cent for uh, manufacturing. And that baseline would be locked in for three years. Senator Daniam. Thank you. So, and you said minimum. So there is a chance that after this work is done they might find themselves in receipt of an adjusted baseline decline of something somewhere between 4.9 and 1 or to, um, and for three years, at what point in time in that three-year cycle do they then uh, engage in a reassessment, uh, for certainty's sake, about what comes after the end of that three-year period on the on the rate? The minister. Two questions there, Senator Dunningham. Um, yes, it is a sliding scale, um, which operates between the standardised expectation of reductions of 4.9 per cent and the minimum of either two or one, depending on the category of entity that we're talking about. You asked about the means by which um, that baseline would be established. It, each year the facility would um, apply and so it would uh, have a, a, a forward baseline established for the forward three years, but that would be reassessed the following year, noting that the if they wish to. Senator Cadell. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I have a in my second reading and again also on NRF spoke about my concerns around a specific company in Orica and their ammonium nitrate uh, production. You've just mentioned ammonium nitrate now as a carve out. My understanding is taking some time so there can be some conversation. Orica may have been in discussions with the government and received some sort of carve-out or the understanding that with some grandfather contracts to 2029 there may be a carve-out in this form in, or some other legislation or delegated legislation to come. Could you tell me how that might come about, what form there it is? and how we could go giving certainty for that investment decision into Gladstone, if that is the case. Minister. Uh, thanks, Senator Cadell. And I was aware of your interest in ORICA. And um, my understanding is that 
the government has been in discussions with Orica about their particular circumstances and having reviewed the contractual arrangements that are in place for them has indicated that it will be possible to grandfather um, that arrangement um, uh, due, to due to the existing contractual circumstances and, and their arrangements with the government. Senator Cadell. Uh, thank you very much. That will be wonderful for the people of Gladstone as well as Newcastle. How are there many other businesses that are in a similar position in the manufacturing space, or is this pretty much a one-off? Minister. Uh, the advice I have, Senator, is that no others have contract beyond two years, so Oracle was in a relatively unique situation. Senator Daniam. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just on further support for the trade exposed industries, there was also the uh, and you've referenced this before, Minister, the providing flexibility and additional support for industry, the targeted funding of at least a billion dollars in funding for the manufacturing sector uh, through the Powering the Regions Fund, including the $400 million for industries providing critical inputs to clean energy industries, including steel, cement and lime, aluminium, alumina, in addition to both the $600 million safeguard transformation stream and other funding pools including the NRF, CEFC and ARENA. Um, could you just first, could you indicate to me how the volume, the quantum of $400 million was arrived at and also in the case of the $600 million for the safeguard transformation stream? Minister. Senator, both of these, of course, are a decision of government, and the $600 million was announced in January as a consequence of consultations. As I've indicated on many occasions throughout this debate, we have been um, in very close consultation with covered sectors, and the additional um, resources, uh, the $400 million announced recently, is again as a consequence of those discussions with stakeholders and their articulation of what would be required to support them through this transition. Daniam. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so, consultation with stakeholders and industry groups. I understand there's at least one uh, manufacturing business that indicated that 600 million wouldn't be enough and that 6 billion was a closer figure for uh, what would be necessary to support a transition. Is the government satisfied that that amount of money is going to actually support these businesses that are trade exposed to be able to get to where they want to be? Um, adequately. Sorry, Chair. The Call the Minister. I keep jumping ahead of the chair, and it's my fault if my microphone doesn't I, work. No, I, di I did call you, but I called you more clearly. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Um, Senator Dunham, just yesterday this chamber finished debate on the National Reconstruction Fund, um, which, as I recall, you opposed. Um, the government is very firm in our commitment to establish arrangements to support manufacturing and industrial activity. The safeguarding mechanism is part of that. It is about providing the certainty that is necessary for those businesses to make the necessary investments to remain competitive in a world that is decarbonising. The National Reconstruction Fund is part of that. It is about providing resources to ensure that we continue to be a country that makes things and, frankly, makes more things than we do at the moment. Um, the Powering the Regions Fund um, more broadly is designed to provide support um, for the, tra the transition and uh, notwithstanding the specific allocations for safeguard facilities, safeguard facilities will also be eligible to apply for the other resources in the Paringa Regions Fund. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Chair. So I referenced um, one business, Rio, who indicated that six billion seemed to be something more adequate than 600 million. So if you do your maths, they're 
indicating that one dollar in every ten dollars required to be spent on the transition is going to be an incredibly significant impost on business to be able to make the transition. Um, I just wonder whether that sort of feedback as part of this very broad consultation which is taken in the views of all stakeholders was considered as part of what government uh, looked at as they moved into um, setting up these funds. Uh, um, if you could indicate to me uh, whether that impost on business, nine out of every ten dollars coming from the business to be able to transition, as opposed to one out of every ten being the support from government to be able to get to where the government, the world, wants them to be. Uh, how has that been factored in? Uh, and indeed, uh, is there any sort of assurance that um, a lack of support isn't going to result in uh, reduction in investment, a loss of jobs, uh, passing on of cost to consumers? Uh, those sorts of things are what we're concerned about here. And based on the feedback of one significant employer, one significant contributor to our economy, it sounds like there's going to be some big costs. So I have a couple more questions uh, on this. I notice Senator Waters probably wants to call. I only have a couple more on these funds, and then perhaps Chair will move there. The Minister. Uh, thanks, Senator Dunningham. Well, of course, uh, we've been very grateful for the engagement with Rio Tinto. I do note that Rio Tinto has their own prior to any obligation imposed by the safeguard mechanism, has their own commitment to net zero by 2050, and that's a commitment that they've made to their shareholders and investors. Um, more broadly, can I just bring a sense of reality to this debate? Like, we have gone through 10 years where the business environment for many of these businesses was terribly uncertain as a consequence of your government's, previous government's inability to land a climate policy or an energy policy. And well I remember the many Senate inquiries that I attended when these same businesses came before us and said that what they desperately wanted was certainty and that that was the thing that would lock, unlock the investment that you're speaking about. So, for example, I remember when the Energy Users Association of Australia said, we have identified five specific areas of concern that have contributed to the current perilous situation being a dysfunctional political environment that has dramatically increased the risk associated with investment. That was what was said when you guys were in charge. Um, the Investor Group on Climate Change back in 2017 said Australian institutional investors have a strong appetite for low carbon assets, but policy uncertainty and a lack of scalable deals are major barriers. They said despite the recent surge in renewable energy investment, investment is still not coming through institutional investors. The federal climate change and energy policy landscape provides no investment certainty. The Energy Supply Association in 2015 said the current uncertainty will itself drive up prices. Banks have put away their checkbooks on energy projects. Policy uncertainty has rendered electricity generation projects unbankable. The cost has been masked because lower demand has meant we haven't needed new projects, but when new assets are needed, that risk premium will be there and it will push up prices. We are moving in an orderly way to put some certainty into the system after a decade of incompetent management. And so we're happy to have a sensible discussion about how we might best do this, what the best implementation arrangements might be. But I do think we have to have a sense of reality about where we are now and how we got here. Senator Dunian. Uh, yes, indeed, I do agree. A sense of reality is important, and that's why I'm very concerned about the parallel universe in which this deal was struck up. Um, which is why I've been asking these questions. And while I appreciate gratuitous political points being made about the last 10 years, it's about looking forward. You won the last election. I find myself on this side of the chamber asking questions of the government about their policy, what it's going to do, how much it will drive up power prices. I mean, I can run through the record of power prices in the last term if you want, but that actually doesn't assist us in understanding what this legislation is actually going to do. So back to reality, the laws that you're seeking to implement, the funds, the huge amounts of taxpayers' money we're seeking to appropriate through the various bits of legislation going through the parliament this week. And I want to just talk about the, the uh, two funds we've talked about already, the 400 and the 600 million. And I would be interested to get a sense of how uh, entities would be able to access support through these funds. Um, what sort of process? Um, who do they speak to? what sort of application form, what thresholds, any data of that nature would be helpful. And then 
Perhaps uh, I might um, I look to Senator Waters down there. I'm sure she has questions, and I can come back to this. Minister. Thanks, Senator Dunningham. I, I provided uh, answers uh, to these same questions to Senator Waters when she asked me earlier about arrangements for accessing the fund. I mean, the short story is that the funds are um, being established in the context of the forthcoming budget and the, the rules and the, the grant, the approach to grants, including the entity that would be responsible for distributing any funds, uh, are, are under development. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, I do have just a few follow-up questions, just sticking first, though, with that last subject matter. Um, in I know you, you said that the delivery mechanism for the Powering the Regions Fund um, is, will be decided through the budget process. I accept that. My question is um, whether or not you've had any feedback from industry or regulators or any quarter, really, that the grants hub for hydrogen hubs and modern manufacturing initiative programs are substandard vehicles for getting projects up and running, and whether that's therefore factoring into your decision making when you decide on the delivery mechanism for the Powering the Regions Hub. Minister. Look, not that I'm aware of, Senator Waters, but um, can I say this? We'd always think carefully about the best way to distribute funds. Um, sometimes a grants hub is a suitable way of doing it, and you'll be aware that the grants hubs across the Commonwealth administer a quite wide range of projects. Uh, in this particular case, we are simply working through um, the best arrangements to distribute the resources in the most effective way, given the particular policy task before us. Senator Waters. Thanks, Minister. Um, can I ask now, I noticed that you were referencing the draft rules before. When will we see the final rules? Do you have a date on that? Um, when will it be registered on freely and ready for us all to see? The Minister. Uh, I'm advised the end of April, Senator. Senator Waters. Thanks, Chair. Um, and just to, in relation to the question that I sought some guidance from you on earlier about how um, the new proposed mechanism will deal with expansions of existing projects that aren't an expansion in uh, scale as such, but rather a temporal expansion. And just um, hoping for an answer to that one, if you've had that advice um, provided. Essentially, it's whether or not the increased emissions will be treated as within the safeguard mechanism or below the coverage. I just want to know how that will be treated. Minister. Uh, Senator Waters, I think it, the best way of answering this is to refer you to the provisions in the Act, um, which sets out the test that the Environment Minister would apply. And, um, so it is this. Uh, if in a financial year the Environment Minister approves uh, the taking of an action for the purpose of a controlling provision within the meaning of the Act, and the Environment Minister is satisfied that the action is likely to result in an increase in the financial year or future financial years of scope one emissions of greenhouse gases from the operation of a designated large facility for the financial year, or a new designated large facility for the financial year or a future financial year, and the Environment Minister has been given an estimate of the scope one emissions of greenhouse ga gases from the taking of the action in one or more financial year, they must give that estimate to the Minister, the Climate Change Secretary and the Climate Change Authority as soon as practicable. And it's the passing on of that information that then triggers um, a consideration by the minister, of um, uh, or indeed any of those um, entities, the minister, the climate change authority, or the secretary, of whether any additional action is required. Senator Waters. Thanks, uh, thanks, chair. Thanks very much, minister. I think I understand that. So I just ask one follow-up question to make sure that I'm I'm following you there. So if the test in the EPV Act, which you just quoted from, was an increase in scope one emissions. So it doesn't have to be a significant increase, it's just any increase. So ergo, in my scenario where I put to you that the time frame 
um, for the operating coal mine would be extended and therefore there'd be an increase in emissions but it wouldn't itself be above the 100,000 trigger. I interpret what you've just read out as saying that that increase would therefore trigger the need for the Environment Minister to pass on the number of those projected scope one emissions, which will then be treated in the fashion that you've taken us through, namely it will be checked against the hard cap. I'm sorry, my I was being too loud. I get that all the time. <laughs> Oh, we might have to start again. Okay. The waters. I was on such a roll. Hopefully, you, you I can, were, you were hopefully very I can articulate. say the same thing again. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to confirm. I just wanted to confirm that it will be any amount of increase because it's already an existing facility. Um, that the EPBC Act is simply extending the temporal range of the approval for that. That increase, however big or small it might be, will be referred. Uh, to the Climate Change Minister to be assessed as to whether it will breach the hard cap in the normal fashion. Minister. Senator Waters, as I indicated when we last discussed this, um, I do think it, it's difficult to give a definitive answer um, without understanding what the overall um, profile of the emissions over time of the operation of the facility might be. However, um, Yes, in the main, if this is a covered facility, no matter the scale of the increase, um, it would be it would engage an obligation to make such a notification. And can I just make a clarification? I, I may have mis misheard this, but just for clarity, uh, the obligation that we're discussing would sit within the Climate Change Act, not within the. Um, Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. Senator Waters. Thanks, Minister. Yes, that was oh, that was my error there. I appreciate the clarification. I'm happy with the answer. Ta. Senator Waters, have you finished this line for um, Senator Dunningham? See the call. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just uh, I wanted to sort of go not to modelling or to internal government deliberations on things, but just a general sense of whether the government thinks these laws will put downward pressure on power prices. Minister. Power generators are not covered by the safeguard mechanism, or at least by the approach considered here. Senator Dunningham. So noting that, um, obviously things are interlinked and it might not cover power generators, but there are inputs, there are other impacts. Will this put downward pressure, to coin a phrase, on electricity prices consistent with uh, everything we've heard in question time this week from the acting leader uh, and last week, consistent with your election policies and every other government member? Will this put downward pressure on electricity prices? Minister. Senator Daniam, the of course the government is thinking always about the optimal pathway for the development of the electricity system, but the amendments before you and the changes that are proposed here don't cover electricity generators. And again, as has been um, put to you on many occasions, um, <laughs> there is something a little odd about being questioned about our determination to put downward pressure on electricity prices when every single member of your party room voted against concrete measures to reduce electricity prices, put downward pressure on electricity prices in December last year. Senator Dunningham. Okay, well, um, again, in the real world where I've been for the last little while, there's been a lot of talk about the uh, agreement that's been reached between the Greens and the Labor Party. Uh, the chilling effect that will have. In fact, no, the direct claim that this will kill off all new coal and gas. Mm. And then there's this basic principle around supply and demand, the economics of supply and demand. And when you don't have enough supply, you can't meet demand. And we need these inputs to be able to generate energy, given the way our energy mix is generated at the moment. And so, to that point, uh, given the arrangement that has been reached here, um, we've talked about it enough, the rooms in which it was reached, 
uh, I'm just seeking to understand whether the claims being made by the Greens about killing off all new coal and gas, uh, what that does to supply, bringing on new supply in order to meet demand, and we only have to look at the ACCC and AEMO who tell us the best way and the only way to deal with uh, some of these cost pressures we're facing with uh, electricity today, tomorrow and into the future are by bringing on supply. The Greens tell us that supply is not going to be met, that, you know, we're killing it off. It's not going to be a part of what happens here, as a part of the arrangements reached under this legislation. Is it still the government's view that this law, this legislation and everything that it entails, even though it doesn't cover energy generators but has the impact that we've talked about here, will put downward pressure on electricity prices in this country? Minister. Senator Daniam, the big facilities, Santos, Shell, have very ambitious goals for reducing their own emissions. I think that Santos uh, is aiming for net zero by 2040. I think Shell to halve uh, their emissions by 2030. Um, these entities, these important participants in Australia's energy system, are already on this pathway. And I think you should reflect on whether the claims you are making are really aligned with the publicly expressed intentions of the companies um, that you are talking about. Um, the safeguard reforms take into account the possibility of new entrants and still deliver 205 million tonnes of abatement. Um, we don't accept that uh, the assertions that you are making around implications for supply. That is not our expectation. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Chair. Not my assertions, the assertions of the Greens and industry leaders, but we'll let the people of Australia be the judge as time marches on and we see the full impact of your laws in partnership with the Greens. If I can just go to uh, the impact on facilities, and there's um, one company, or I've got a range here I want to run through as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Incitec Pivot, one of our nation's leading suppliers of fertilisers, you'd be familiar <coughs> with them, uh, who have a number of facilities up in Queensland that are going to be impacted by the changes, as I understand it. I just wonder if I can start by asking um, how many Australian farmers rely on products, fertiliser products, produced by Incitec Pivot? Minister. Senator Daniam, I don't intend to comment on the individual business decisions of individual businesses. That's really not something I'm in a position to do. Senator Dunningham. Um, I'm not asking about, uh, thank you, Chair, individual business decisions. Um, obviously, the laws we make in this place have an impact on the cost of doing business. It's what we've been talking about. You've just told me I'm wrong for suggesting that anything we do here has an impact of that nature. I'm asking about Australian farmers uh, who are relying on this business. I just wondered whether, as part of the broad-ranging consultations that have occurred that you've talked about, whether this sort of thing with the stakeholders, I don't know, the NFF or the Queensland equivalent, etc., might have uh, reached into the consultation process and indicated that the facilities that Incitec Pivot owns, um, you know, what sort of an impact any changes to the arrangements they operate under would have on the farmers. Hence my question around how many farmers rely on the products from them. But while you consider that, um, uh, energy and fertiliser make up half of the total operating cost to grow crops like oats, wheat and barley. Um, has there been any assessment of the financial impact of Labor's changes to the safeguard mechanism uh, on farmers that grow these crops? Minister. Uh, you asked me about um, the fertiliser question um, and what impact it might have on um, fertiliser. And I guess the answer is, and it's why I'm reluctant to comment on individual facilities, the impact of these reforms will vary between facilities within these sectors. So some facilities that have a lower emissions intensive production might receive safeguard mechanism credits. They would be able to sell those to other safeguard facilities. And as we've already canvassed at length, um, 
trade tailored assistance is available for trade exposed facilities. Um, for the agricultural sector, it is perhaps worth noting this that the safeguard reforms will result in increased demand for ACUs, um, incentivising abatement in the land sector uh, and allowing landowners and farmers to generate another source of income. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Chair. And of course, I'm sure, I, in fact, I know Senator Brockman has some questions and perhaps others around the NFF's concerns around uh, the turbocharging, as the NFF put it, of uh, demand on. Um, uh, carbon abatement uh, on the land. Um, so, look, I, I don't want you to, um, you know, try and guess what businesses are doing. This is, I guess, using this company as an example. Um, you know, Intertec Pivot has a number of entities in Queensland that will be affected by the changes here, um, and there will be an increase in the cost of what they do. Uh, the IMF actually found that a 1 per cent rise in the cost of fertiliser prices um, increases food commodity prices by 0.45 per cent. So I wonder whether the minister you might indicate whether the government accepts that there's a close correlation between, for example, fertiliser price increases and how much Australians pay for their groceries. And to that end, if there is an increase in uh, the cost of doing business for Instatec Pivot, for them to produce the products that farmers are relying on, uh, that that would then be passed on to the consumer. Is that something that's been contemplated and that potentially concerns the government? Minister. Uh, Senator Dunning, the government is in fact very concerned <coughs> about um, the affordability of food and groceries um, and indeed in the October budget uh, fruit and vegetable prices were estimated to be 8 per cent higher than that, what they would otherwise have been, and it was a consequence of the flooding events at the time. And the truth is that climate change is resulting in increased frequency and severity of severe weather events like droughts, flooding, fire and storms. Um, these events do disrupt supply chains, impact productivity and increase insurance costs for business and consumers. Um, and I raise this because it's an example of the mistaken analysis of looking at only one variable in the costs that are affecting Australian consumers. We are going through a period of change, change in what's expected from the investment community, uh, in our global markets, in our global supply chains and, frankly, in the operating environment, uh, particularly for Australian farmers. Um, we understand and major agricultural producers understand that the transformation towards net zero is extremely important um, because it impacts more than most sectors the capacity the ongoing capacity of the agricultural sector to produce food and fibre. Senator Dunningham. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. And I look I appreciate that um, analysis and of course uh, in addition to those increased costs relating to fruit and vegetables that, that you mentioned, Minister, the ABS indicated the cost of bread and cereal products have increased by 12.2 per cent over the last year, and meat and seafood increasing by 8.2 per cent, and dairy and related products increasing by 14.9 per cent. So it's across the board, and I accept that uh, there are variables, many uh, in, in inputs, uh, but that doesn't mean we should, um, just because there are other impacts on the price, including uh, climate-induced flooding or drought, uh, those sorts of things don't mean we should then up the price or put pressures on industry elsewhere. So, look, um, I'm going to move off uh, the farming component now, if I can, uh, and I might go to um, uh, some broader questions around facilities, uh, if I may, around the 215 facilities captured under the mechanism. Um, how many of those facilities had existing plans to reduce their emissions by 30 per cent by 2030? Minister. Well, the information I've provided to the Chamber is that 80 per cent have a commitment to reduce um, their emissions to net zero by 2050. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so, 80 per cent of those 215 facilities have a plan and a commitment to reach uh, 
well, reduce their emissions by 30% by 2030. There is a net zero. Minister. Uh, I said net zero by 2050. Senator Dunning. Thank you, Chair. So uh, then I'll ask my question again. How many of the 215 facilities captured by the safeguard mechanism had existing plans to reduce their emissions by 30% by 2030? There are obviously some Fortescue net zero by 2030, but I mean I, I don't have a complete um, list of the 2030 commitments for all of the covered facilities. Um, Senator Dunningham. Um, does the government intend, or did the government at any point intend to interrogate how many of the facilities captured by the safeguard mechanism? did have a plan that mirrored, matched, bettered, was close to the government's plans to uh, reduce emissions by the target amount? Minister. Our focus is meeting our national target. And as we talked about in this chamber on many occasions, that is because it is the single most significant thing that Australia can do to catalyse the necessary global action that we need to tackle dangerous climate change. Um, we have been through this afternoon and this morning uh, the extensive consultation process that has been undertaken, talking with all of these facilities. We examined, uh, in many instances, um, you know, businesses were keen to discuss with the department their plans, their thinking. Uh, there is a wealth of information in the public domain. In fact, I was just recently, just now, pointed to Incitec Pivot's um, climate change report, um, which talks about their commitment to reducing emissions and the four projects that they are undertaking, Australia and internationally, as they seek to deliver material change in their operational emissions. They say that these projects collectively give us a pathway above 42 per cent reduction in the medium term with our current asset portfolio. I mean, business is doing this. And as we've canvassed in a range of different ways over the course of the debate, uh, they are doing so in as a consequence of a range of forces, including um, the investor community. Senator Duncan. Uh, thank you. So just back on 2030, I just to seek clarification. Did you say uh, Instatech Pivot was reaching the 42 per cent reduction by 2030? I'm reading to you from their media release, which indicates that they intend to they say that these projects collectively give us a pathway above 42 per cent reduction in the medium term with our current asset portfolio. Senator Duncan. I'm not sure what medium term is, but I just I'll ask one more time on this question around the facilities that are, you know, there's only 215 of them. Whether the government is or did before going down this pathway seek to understand how many of the 215 facilities caught by the safeguard mechanism had plans to reduce their emissions by 30% by 2030. Senator Dunningham, I have answered your question. I will give it one more go, which is to say that I don't think it is undoubtedly the case that the government has engaged deeply and over an extended period of time with the community, with the regulated community in relation to this reform. Uh, we have talked about the many activities that took place, the roundtables, the public consultation, the written consultation the um, targeted meetings, because the government does seek to deeply understand the plans and um, uh, commitments of the businesses that are engaged in the safeguard mechanism. Um, that involved talking to them about their plans. Did the department gather exactly the data you're requesting? Perhaps no. But I don't think that you can deny that there has been deep and sustained engagement over a long period of time with the covered businesses. Senator Dunningham. Oh, thank you, Chair. Look, um, no, I don't deny what you said about the 
deep, sustained, thorough consultation. Um, you made a point there about deeply understanding the businesses. I would have thought whether businesses had plans that mirrored, matched, something similar to what the government was intending to do would be something government might have done, but you said you've answered. You've told me you don't have that data, or the government perhaps doesn't have that data. I just was provided Instec Pivot said they'd reduced by 25 per cent by 2030, so that's handy to know. Um, I will just ask, as part of the agreement with the Greens, um, all new gas fields supplying LNG facilities will need to fully, uh, be fully offset from day one. Does this apply to new wells or just new projects? I wonder if there's any clarity there. Oh, my apologies and sorry, uh, sorry, Chair. Um, Minister, I just wanted to pause because your characterisation of the arrangements was not quite accurate and I thought it best to give you um, very specific information. Um, new gas fields supplying existing liquefied natural gas facilities will be treated as new facilities regardless of their ownership structure. And on that basis, they will be given international best practice baselines for the carbon dioxide in their new fields. And so for these fields, reservoir CO2 emissions, best practice is zero, given the existence of low CO2 fields and opportunities for carbon capture and storage. Senator Darlingham. So to be clear, Minister, that includes the expansion of existing operations. Is that right? Minister. What I've indicated is that it is where there is a new gas field, um, whether or not the expansion of an existing uh, um, operation was understood in those terms is really dependent on the particular circumstances and it is only for those supplying existing liquefied natural gas facilities. Donningham. Thank you, Chair. Beg your pardon. Uh, we might come back with a couple of further questions on that because I am interested in exactly what might apply without going into hypotheticals and cameos. Uh, I know Senator Pocock, David Pocock, has some questions, um, so I'll just ask this one, which I suspect you may not be able to answer, but I just wanted to know whether the financial data that was used to model the impact of the safeguard mechanism on uh, individual safeguard facilities, was it, by, was it information relating to the facilities or was it about the um, information relating to the corporate entities that owned the facilities? Implicit in your question, I think, is a set of assumptions about um, inputs and the, and, and the workings of the modelling. I've given you, uh, on successive occasions, and also Senator Hughes, um, some indication of what work was done. I've also indicated that it was cabinet in confidence and commercially sensitive. Uh, I don't intend to have any deeper discussion about the contents or the nature of the modelling. Senator Darlingham. Uh, look, just on that, uh, look, uh, I understand Cabinet and Confidence. We've tried to seek the information and you know, uh, see even a private briefing would have been, of offering a private briefing on the way through might have been handy. But look, um, it, it's been put to me that the information used to underpin the modelling was uh, 
corporate data reported rather than by facility, which to my mind, and I'd, I'd appreciate if you could confirm otherwise, but to my mind that might skew the data that underpins the modelling. And look, it's, it's hard to pursue this properly because we are operating uh, without access to the information, and you've explained why, and I'm not going to ask you to table it or go into detail on it. But if, if an assurance can't be provided that that information, uh, as I've just characterised it, um, wouldn't result in a skewed outcome, i.e. it is facility as opposed to corporate, which is what I'm told would be a better arrangement, then I think we have some concerns. So I just wonder if you can provide that assurance that uh, the information provided, the financial data, was by facility. I don't want to know what it said or um, have it tabled. I just want to know that it was by facility as opposed to a corporate level piece of information. Minister. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, in, in the interest of the Senate's time, I um, I'd like to just make a few remarks and briefly um, foreshadow amendments um, that will be circulated later for when we get to them and, and then pop a question at the end if that's all right. Um, I've been a senator uh, in this place for a, uh, for a short time, um, but like all senators I, I'm conscious of history and one thing seems very clear to me is that this parliament will be judged on the way that it approaches climate change. Um, we know that there is no time to waste, uh, not just because the scientists are urging us and warning us, as we saw in the, in the recent IPCC report, but because we are starting to live with the impacts. We are seeing the impacts across the country. Our farmers uh, um, are feeling the impacts. Their profits are down 20 per cent since the year 2000 due to climate change. This is here. This is 1.1 degrees of warming that we're living with. And the consequences for moving uh, beyond 1.5 degrees of warming are, are stark. We know that there are tipping points for cascading climate breakdown. Um, and failure to take action is morally irresponsible. Um, this week, as a parliament, we are taking a significant step in the right direction. Uh, but to be clear, the reform is far from perfect. We are a long way away from the ideal climate policy in Australia. Economists, including the Productivity Commission, tell us the most efficient way to encourage climate action is to put an economy-wide price on carbon as many other uh, countries have done. Uh, this mechanism only covers the 215 heavy submitters, as we have heard. Um, and we must uh, ensure that we keep that in mind, because it is, it is very clear that uh, this mechanism is not in line with the goal of 1.5 degrees of warming. It's a start, but our ambition is not enough. Uh, furthermore, the whole mechanism is built on offsets, which we know should only be used as a last resort. Um, in this policy, they're available without restriction. Uh, as has been noted, the, other only, the only other country who allows unrestricted offsets is Kazakhstan. Uh, um, but politics is all about um, compromise and, and, and um, getting things in place. And this reform, while far from perfect, is a substantial step in the right direction. Uh, the reform will put downward pressure on emissions from the industrial sector, and that alone is a big change. Finally, businesses will have better incentives to invest in new technologies and decarbonise. For too long in this country, the business community has been ahead of government on the issue of climate change. The businesses I speak to want to decarbonise to give themselves the edge in a competitive international environment. Many of our major trading partners are moving away from fossil fuels and starting to look for low or no carbon products. 
It's up to us here in this place and those in the other to create a regulatory environment that will encourage the success of future industries like green steel and green aluminium. We need to incentivise decarbonisation so the businesses we want to form part of our future are able to decarbonise and remain here in Australia. I welcome the government's commitment to provide an additional $400 million uh, from the Power in the Regions Fund to assist strategic industries like steel, cement and aluminium to decarbonise. But the reality is that the billion dollar total is a drop in the ocean when it comes to the capital cost of technology transition and decarbonisation. Uh, we have seen the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States and a similar measure uh, in the U EU provide a huge boost for sustainable manufacturing. I call on the government to do more in the upcoming budget to support the businesses and industries that will drive future economic growth. But businesses are not the only ones calling for action on climate. People around the country want us to take a step forward, a step that will result in actual reductions in emissions. They're clearly frustrated with the politics of climate change and want to get on with the job of making our future safe. Uh, my sense is that they, they want a step forward, a step in the right direction, even if it does not go far enough. This policy, despite its flaws, is a significant step in the right direction. Our heaviest emitters will reduce their net emissions by more than 200 million tonnes between now and 2030. Total emissions will come down. Uh, new fossil fuel projects will find it more difficult to set up, extract our resources, send them, along with hefty profits overseas, while they continue to damage our climate, uh, the climate that we, we share. Um, and on the back of this, new green industries will develop. Uh, I would like to acknowledge Minister Bowen and his, his office for their work on the safeguard mechanism. Uh, throughout discussions and negotiations with the minister, uh, there was much we did not agree on, uh, but it was clear where the minister stood, and I thank him for the way he approached our conversations. Um, ultimately, uh, a point was reached where, I, where I'm satisfied that the reform is a substantial step in the right direction, but we need to move a lot faster. This is just a step. Um, I call on the government to have more ambition as they formulate the many pieces of climate policy we will need to make up for the decades of inaction so we can protect the people and places we love. Uh, there is so much work to do from fuel efficiency standards uh, to electrification across households and businesses and the setting of a far more ambitious 2035 emissions reduction target. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, safeguard mechanism before us, and I, and I really believe that this reform can be improved, I plan to move a series of amendments and, um, as I said, to save the Senate's time, I will foreshadow them now. Uh, amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 1903 circulated in my name uh, improves the way that offsets are used under the reform. Offsets are a very necessary um, part of this but should be reserved for hard-to-abate industries. Um, they should only be used as a last resort, and this amendment will make sure that that is the case. Amendment 3 on 1903 removes the price cap on ACUs and limits the risk to taxpayers should the cap be breached. Uh, if we're going to have a market mechanism, I, I don't see the reason to put a ceiling on the price. Um, if you're going to use the market to try and uh, fix this, then it really doesn't make sense to cap it and in doing so potentially expose the Commonwealth and, and taxpayers um, to a liability should the Commonwealth run out of ACUs. Uh, the amendments on sheet 1915 discounts the value of offsets if more than 50% 50 50 of compliance with baseline is achieved through offsetting. Uh, this will drive on-site abatement and bring forward investment in decarbonisation. If we're not going to have a hard cap on ACUs, there is provision in, um, in the, uh, the regulation-making powers for the minister to discount uh, ACUs, um, referred to as the forfeits rule, and I really believe this would be a 
a valuable tool in imposing a uh, carbon mitigation hierarchy, which is you know, well established and acknowledged around the world. It makes sense for Australia to have one of, um, one of them embedded in this legislation. Uh, the amendments on sheet uh, 1907 extend standing to allow third parties to challenge issues in the carbon market. This is simply an accountability measure that will improve the integrity of the carbon market. There has been much conjecture um, about certain methodologies. This whole um, reform hinges on integrity in offsets. Uh, it makes sense to me that people should be able to uh, go through the process of, of challenging uh, projects should they think that there are issues. For me, the most significant detractor from this bill is the unlimited access to offsets. Um, I have concerns that it is shifting a huge amount of emissions reductions onto the land sector um, rather than Thank abating you, them on site. Senator Pocock. Um, I'm in the hands of the Chamber. Uh, Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Minister, I've just been up at a Dairy Australia function where they felt quite uh, caught by surprise by the uh, amendments to this legislation around human-induced regeneration. Um, have you identified the number of projects that are, are currently registered that would be affected by this legislation? Minister. Uh, Senator Macdonald, I have answered this question already earlier in the debate, but um, the number of projects um, associated with human induced regeneration is 371. Now, there is no reason to believe, uh, well, perhaps to start about what is uh, what the commitment is here. We have committed to the Chubb Review. Uh, the Chubb Review recommendation eight makes a series of recommendations about how the human-induced regeneration method should be interpreted by the CER when it's evaluating um, projects and evaluating credits. Uh, to be uh, assigned as a consequence of activities within projects. Um, and our expectation is that the Clean Energy Regulator will adopt that and apply those recommendations as set out by Professor Chubb. So it is true that 371 is the maximum number of projects that may be implicated, but in truth, we've got no reason to think that these projects are not already um, in compliance, and we expect that um, how this will be implemented is that when those project proponents go to the Clean Energy Regulator to seek their um, uh, to seek their credits, it would be at that point that the Clean Energy Regulator um, would assess uh, would seek to implement the recommendations around interpretation of the method that were made by Professor Chubb. Uh, Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Chair. Um, I believe Senator Brockman has some more uh, questions in this regard, so I, perhaps I won't dwell on it. If I could turn to uh, back to the resources sector. Um, I listened carefully when you spoke earlier about not disclosing the detail of the modelling. Um, however, I've had consultation with a number of uh, of the 215 emitters who tell me that whilst they have a program to reduce emissions uh, over the medium term, uh, they will not meet the targets by 2030. Uh, when they've raised this in consultation with the department that they've been told um, that they will just have to pay the penalty, has there been modelling done by, uh, by the department that would um, provide information on the budgetary impact of that? Minister. Uh, Senator Macdonald, um, it's not the—I uh, don't believe that the, that the 
the, di the dialogue as you characterise it um, is a fair characterisation of the many interactions that have occurred between the department and stakeholders over a um, very long period of time and by multiple means. However, of course, if people have concerns, uh, I would always be open to making a referral and my door is always open to stakeholders. Um, I was asked this same question, I think, by one of your colleagues, and the answer I provided is that the government does not anticipate um, a revenue stream of any kind arising from businesses paying the penalty. Historically, the level of compliance within the safeguard mechanism was 100 per cent. Senator MacDonald. Uh, so uh, if the modelling uh, would imply that the compliance will be 100%. Um, there are resources company that have identified that the technology is not yet available to them to allow them to um, uh, make the transition, particularly from diesel, from uh, new motors that would allow them to comply with the. I'm sorry, don't, if you're listening to something, I don't want to interrupt you. That might assist me with my answer. Should I give you a second? Before I start, uh, I was actually incredibly listening to both. But, uh, <laughs> well done. <Yeah. laughs> I want your skills. Yes. Yeah. 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 Senator Shoebridge, I'm just in the middle of a dialogue between Senator Macdonald and, and the Minister. Senator Macdonald, do you want to call? Yes, yes, yes Senator Macdonald. Thank you. Uh, so uh, what I was asking, Minister, was that um, uh, resources projects have advised me that they are on a pathway to emissions reduction, net zero. Uh, but that the technology that would allow them to convert from diesel to new motors won't be available to them uh, by the 2030 timeframe. Uh, one uh, of those emitters told me that it would be a $50 million penalty uh, that they expect it will cost them, the safeguards mechanism will cost them. Um, and so I guess I'm trying to understand in the extensive consultation that has happened between the department and uh, resource companies, uh, if there is an understanding of the cost impact on the resources sector across, well, I'm sorry, I should say across the 250, because it's not just resources sectors, across the 250 big emitters, uh, given that we have companies that are, have modelled themselves the cost that it will um, they will incur. Minister. Uh, thanks, Senator Macdonald. And may I say, I do appreciate your reference, um, you referring to the plans that some of these businesses do, in fact, um, have in place. Uh, I think one of the things that a mature debate might recognise is that many of these businesses are thinking very carefully about their own transition to net zero. Um, you know, the uh, Minerals Council of Australia, of course, um, has you know, regularly issues a progress report on how the sector is moving, and they, you know, are, are very thoughtful. I think about uh, the technologies that will be necessary to get there. Um, and so, for example, you know, the, the Minerals Council most recent report indicated that the mining industry recognises the need to reduce emissions globally, nationally, and at the sites and facilities driving Australia's resources industry. Um, they go on to say that achievement of both the 2030 target and the 2050 net zero target will require close consultation with stakeholders. And that is a welcome and positive engagement from the government's perspective and I suspect from the community's perspective as well. Um, the safeguard mechanism is deliberately designed to minimise the costs associated with implementation and it provides flexibility for that reason. We've had a very big debate in recent months around the nature of the government's reforms to the safeguard mechanism where various people have expressed views about that flexibility. Um, but it is, for the reasons you describe, there are limitations on the technology available this decade for some of the covered facilities. 
and that is why the um, rule and in, again in addition to that in some instances the necessary investment to um, make a, a reduction may well be somewhat lumpy it might be something that you do at a certain point in time and so the design of the compliance arrangements allows for borrowing it allows for banking it allows for a business who makes a large a large investment now to reduce their emissions below the baseline that's required of them in, say, this financial year, to create credits and sell them to another provider. Uh, and of course, it allows for the purchase of ACUs, which has been the subject of quite some public discussion. All of these design features are there to provide flexibility and to allow optimal progression towards net zero, whilst maintaining an incentive to, 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 to get on that journey. Um, many of the businesses that are covered uh, already have a public commitment um, to net zero by 2050, and many of them have interim targets as well. Uh, we've talked quite a bit here about the modelling and analysis that has been undertaken. Um, and I think, I guess, I suppose I would say to you that the most important feature of the policy development about this has been a very extended engagement and consultation process with business. It's run over a very long period of time. It's been um, supported by um, Senate inquiry process. It's been supported by public uh, consultation, the issuing of discussion papers. Uh, we have engaged deeply to understand how these impacts might bear on individual businesses and on sectors. Uh, and we've done our best to strike a balance, um, many stakeholders telling us that we've done so, providing the certainty that business needs to make necessary investments, but also getting us on the path that we need to meet our commitments to the international community. I'll Senator McDonald, and then I'll go to um, the rear of the chamber. I probably will have to go to Senator Shoebridge, Senator Pocock, because um, you did have a call before. So, Senator McDonald, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, uh, Minister, I won't continue pressing you because my sense is, is that there has that you're not going to be able to provide me with the number for the uh, for the 215 companies that have identified that they don't have the technology available before 2030 to meet the uh, emissions reductions that are modelled, the 4.9 per cent each year. Um, and so subsequently, um, I think I'm going to have to find another way to identify that information. I have one company that's identified $50 million. Uh, if we extract that across the 215, that is going to be a significant impost on those businesses. And I think that if the government doesn't know what that number is, uh, I'm concerned because that is going to be money that would otherwise go into jobs, um, emissions reductions um, and, and other investments. So I think that the, the gap in the government's understanding of the impact of this um, tax will be uh, is a gap um, that should be understood and appreciated um, by both the tax department, this department, but certainly by the business community more broadly. Um, Minister, if I could turn to asking, how did the government determine the priority industries which would qualify for funding? So, for example, um, the government has picked out cement and aluminium. Uh, if, if they're part of the energy transition, uh, why would iron ore or met coal, um, copper and nickel all of which the World Bank say are essential, not have also been included in that list. Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, the critical minerals are, of course, the subject of a separate process and a separate strategy for government. Uh, the sectors that you're referring to now um, are essentially judged to be critical to the clean energy transformation for the manufacturing sector, retaining this capability uh, for these hard-to-abate sectors is uh, 
in our judgment and based on the feedback we received through the consultation essential and it was on that basis that we made adjustments to uh, the arrangement the scheme design and some of the financial arrangements as announced by the minister earlier in the week so I'll go to Senator Shoebridge now. Oh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Well, this bill has made it abundantly clear that the Labor Party still functions as the political wing of the coal and gas industry, because Labor's first draft of this bill actually allowed carbon pollution to rise and unlimited dodgy offsets to flood the market. It was literally insupportable. And billion-dollar multinational fossil fuel companies like Woodside, Santos, Adani, the Minerals Council, Chevron, it's clear that they write the climate policies of both major parties. Coal and gas co corporations remain the puppeteers of both Labor and the Coalition. And unfortunately, as we saw from the first draft of this bill, Labor is a very willing pu puppet, despite all the promises of the climate election, despite climate scientists, experts, every credible international organisation telling us we need to keep all new coal and gas in the ground as the bare minimum to save our burning planet, Labor is still refusing to deliver that national climate policy that seriously addresses the science and, and that meets the reality of the climate emergency. The Greens negotiated long and hard on this bill because we knew and we know that we can't wait another moment for climate action. We know how important it is to take immediate action to keep every single tonne of coal and gas in the ground that we can. And that's why we kept going back. That's why we kept fighting. So when we look at where we've landed, what does this actually mean for those of us, the millions of Australians, who care about and voted for and demand the climate action the science is telling us? It shows we've got our work cut out for us. It shows we need to break up the weird, toxic marriage between the fossil fuel industry and the, and the Commonwealth government. We need to stop the revolving door of major party donors who literally switch their seats in this place for seats in the boardrooms of some of the most polluting companies in the world. Because it's no wonder that climate politics are so cooked when the chefs are paid, paid and run by the fossil fuel industry. But there is good news. In the face of all of those forces, in the face of decades of obstruction against climate action, and despite Labor continuing to act as the, fossil, as the political wing of the fossil fuel industry, the Greens have secured some genuine wins that will actually make pollution go down and do it in a serious way. Because coal and gas have taken a huge hit with what's been negotiated by the Greens team. And I want to give credit to Adam Bant and his team uh, for taking that hard road, for continuing to go to the negotiating table despite what, what at many times seemed to be a no from the fossil fuel industry delivered by the Albanese government. But here are some of the key wins the Greens have secured. A legislated hard cap on emissions, which means that emissions will ratchet down and actual pollution must decrease, not just be offset. That will effectively knock off around half of Labor's 116 coal and gas projects. Now, that's a huge blow to the worst polluting projects and will make a real difference to the climate. And here's a big reason to celebrate. We've derailed the Beetaloo and Barossa gas fields. And I pay tribute to those First Nations communities and activists. I pay tribute to Senator Dorinda Cox, who have campaigned long and hard against those projects. We're not done, but the future sure is looking brighter. And the Greens have secured a pollution trigger, a carbon trigger, which will force the government to assess the climate impact of all new coal and gas projects. A climate trigger has been a key demand of the environment movement for years now. And we've knocked off most of the dodgiest class of assets. Our changes could take about a quarter of future offsets out of circulation. And mean companies have to commit to more actual pollution reduction and the cost of those offsets, the cost of doing nothing, will go up. And crucially, new gas fields will have to be net zero from day one. That means opening up new gas is increasingly, increasingly not viable financially. Now, we know that's not enough. We know that coal and gas 
all new coal and gas needs to stay in the ground if we're going to keep this planet livable and secure and deliver a secure future for our kids and their kids. We have work cut out for us to break up that toxic marriage between the fossil fuel industry and the major parties in this place. The fact we had to fight Labor tooth and nail to secure these wins is more than frustrating, but it also shows what we can win. And we don't win that alone here in Parliament. We win that because there are millions of Australians behind us demanding this action. Now, the fight's not over, but today we take hope from the fact that we've stopped many of the 116 new coal and gas projects in the pipeline from going ahead. We take hope from the fact that carbon pollution, for the first time, will be compelled to go down. And we take hope from the fact that we've de derailed the Beetaloo and, and Barossa gas fields. And we can also take heart from the fact that the share price of several large coal and gas co corporations took a hit straight off the back of the announcement of what the Greens had achieved. The safeguard mechanism, this bill, which regulates Australia's 215 biggest polluters, will now have a hard cap on emissions, thanks to the work of the Greens, meaning real pollution must actually come down. And the coal and gas corporations can't just keep paying their way out with dodgy, with dodgy offsets. These are big steps towards a future with no coal and gas. But let's be clear, this is the, this is the start of an ongoing fight. And every single coal and gas project that gets that gets approved, if any do. Every single one will be approved by Labor because the only thing stopping us implementing policy that meets the science, that keeps all new coal and gas projects in the ground, the only thing that's stopping that is the lack of Labor's ambition. I, take, I again give credit to those millions of Australians who voted for more. And we are here to continue to deliver for more. And we'll support this bill because we know it's going to make a meaningful difference. But by no means is this the end of the struggle. Senator Brockman. You, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, well, I was going to ask a, a question, but uh, I, I feel that I do need to respond to some of uh, that. And uh, in addressing this bill, I mean, really, we have the Greens standing up in this place talking proudly about having depressed the share price of great Australian companies like Woodside. Uh, you know, I, I find it shocking that they would stand up in this place, and these are the people who have just done a deal with the Labor government. These are the people who have just done a deal with the Labor government, uh, a government they describe as corrupt, ecocidal petrostate. A corrupt, ecocidal petrostate. This is the deal that you've done, Senator Shoebridge. And then you stand up in here, you stand up in here, and you talk about how wonderful it is that you depress the share price of a great West Australian company, a company that is in the super funds of hundreds of thousands of West Australians, particularly, but Australians. Uh, a company that employs thousands of Western Australians in a secondary flow-on uh, effects. Uh, employs uh, probably tens of thousands. Uh, it, it supplies gas to the dom gas of Western Australia, which provides energy and heat to industri industrial uses right across my home state of Western Australia. WA is also the highest domestic gas user in Australia, so it provides heating, provides gas for stoves, it provides gas for hot water. Uh, this is a great Western Australian company. It doesn't deserve to be treated with contempt by this place, by this Labor government, in alliance with the Greens. And, and again, I just I, ca I can't get past this. This you know, they, the, the Senator McKim described the government they just did a deal with as a corrupt, ecocidal petrostate. Uh, you know, this is the kind of alliance in government that we have between the Labor Party and the Greens. Now, I, I do have some substantive questions to the minister, but I'll leave it there for now and let Senator Macdonald. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, following on from my comments earlier, one of my big concerns is the reliance on the land sector and offsetting. And I have had concerns raised with me by Farmers, um, some farmers having, who do have carbon projects, are generating 
Accus saying that they would prefer not to have to sell their Accus to fossil fuel companies who are making their uh, lives harder, are risking their family farming operations. Um, and earlier today, the National Farmers Federation put out a media release titled Safeguard Mechanism Needs to be Safe for Agriculture. And uh, to quote the CEO of the NFF, uh, Tony Ma, the safeguard mechanism will turbocharge demand for offsets, and with few other options on the table, emitters will look to farmland. Uh, agriculture is a truly hard to abate sector. Um, unlike fossil fuels, we, we, we have alternatives um, for them, particularly new, uh, new fossil fuel projects. There, there is there's no real argument for them. Um, farmers who wish to offset their own emissions or inset their emissions um, are concerned about competing with fossil fuel companies for offsets. Um, offsets that will most likely come from the land sector. We've seen farmers having to compete with fossil fuel companies for water during drought. Um, they simply don't have the same, the same budgets, the same access to capital. Uh, what reassurance can the government give that farmers um, will not suffer in the long term as, as a result of the high offset prices due to huge demand from fossil fuel companies? Minister. Thanks very much, Chair, and thanks for your question, Senator Pocock. Um, the situation you describe is an interesting one, isn't it? Because implicit in the way that you ask the question is an acknowledgement that the land sector potentially in a low carbon world is a source of real value. Uh, it, it offers enormous potential to store carbon and once a value is attached to that, that's potentially a source of value for landowners and landholders. Um, that can provide social, economic, environmental benefits to regional communities and to the landholders themselves. Um, and there are co-benefits as well, uh, soil carbon projects um, obviously have a carbon benefit, but they also improve soil health and potentially agricultural productivity. And we've got lots of people operating in that way now around the country, doing really interesting work and I think uh, advocating in really interesting ways for, for um, sustainable farming. Um, but you're right, it's not without tensions and we ought to pay attention to the way that change impacts on regional communities. This was something that was considered by Professor Chubb in his review and that review recommended that the government continue to support regional communities to participate in, to benefit from ACU um, creation and the government is working on implementing that recommendation. Um, as a first step, the government will implement a $20 million carbon farming outreach program. Uh, this program will support farmers and other land managers to access independent, trusted advice to empower them to make informed decisions about whether and how to participate in carbon markets. And this will make ensure that farmers can make the decisions that are right for them and right for their businesses. Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister, if we could just turn back to our last topic. Um, I asked, some questions, uh, asked a question about how did the government determine the priority industries which would qualify for funding. Um, I identified some other uh, transition materials, iron ore, met coal, nickel and copper, none of which uh, are on the critical minerals list. Uh, surprising to many, because I believe that they should, uh, many of those should be listed, but they're not. But I, so, how did you pick out cement and aluminium um, to be priority industries which would qualify for funding? Minister, uh, Senator Macdonald, <clears throat> may I return to the sort of broad idea that I've put to this um, chamber on many occasions over the last hours? Uh, which is that this has been a very detailed process of engagement and discussion with businesses um, and there were some particular issues that were identified through the course of the consultation and they've led the government to um, create a separate stream of funding for the manufacturing, se manufacturing sector as you've described. 
However, I th I, uh, for clarity, um, all safeguard mechanism participants uh, are broadly eligible to uh, will be broadly eligible to participate in the powering the regions um, fund allocations overall and all you know, subject to other eligibility criteria uh, and there is also the original 600 million dollars there for decarbonisation um, and so uh, that is available to a broad range of safeguard participants Senator Macdonald thank you well that is good news minister i'm sure that all the resource um, companies will have taken that on board and will be examining the other uh, uh, require the other guidelines that you just referred to uh, are they available yet those guidelines for application for um, the energy transition fund or for the um, Sorry for the priority industry funding, or for the $600 million uh, decarbonisation fund. Minister, uh, Senator, I have answered this already. Um, the government is developing the funding allocation approach, including the delivery mechanism uh, or the delivery entity for uh, both the $600 million fund and the $400 million fund as part of the budget. Um, <coughs> If I can just, uh, for clarity, just uh, run through with you again the, the eligibility for both of those, because I just want to make sure that we are both talking about the same thing. Um, yes, yeah, so no, I'm just trying to run. I just would like to run through with you specifically. So there are two streams, and I'll give them their proper names so that we can be talking about the same thing. Um, the Safeguard Transformation Stream will provide dedicated funding for projects that reduce emissions at safeguard facilities that are trade exposed. And that stream will support projects that reduce emissions covered by the safeguard mechanism. Um, so uh, specifically in eligible facilities, scope one emissions. It's intended to be technology and project neutral and could support a range of project types like energy efficiency upgrades, shifts to lower carbon processes and fuel switching. Um, the second stream, which I think is the one you were originally asking about, is a $400 million um, stream of funding that's been announced for industries providing critical inputs to clean energy industries. Uh, and as I've just indicated now, the program guidelines will be developed for the, both of these programs in the coming months. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. Um, all right. So I, I guess I've asked you a couple of times about how it was identified that cement and aluminium were in, um, but you're saying to me that those other um, important transition uh, elements like copper and nickel, iron ore uh, and met coal would be able to apply under the developing guidelines for the four, uh, $400 million fund. Is, can I just clarify that that's correct? Have I understood that correctly? Minister. Almost correctly. <laughs> um, the $600 million fund is the safeguard transformation stream. And that is funding that will reduce emissions at safeguard facilities that are trade exposed. Um, the definition of a trade exposed activity um, is defined in, uh, by what are called production variables and they exist in the rules, uh, the draft rules that have been published um, alongside um, this legislation. Senator Macdonald. So many questions, so little time, Chair. Thank you. Um, so, in determining the hard cap on emissions, has there been a calculation how long the safeguard mechanism facilities currently covered will operate for? I'm, I'm wondering if that means no new entry for hard to abate industries unless facilities close. Minister. So the safeguard mechanism 
makes an assessment about the likely emissions um, in the case of uh, no intervention and seeks to um, apply our 43 per cent obligation to the covered entities. Um, it, in establishing the um, baseline reduction requirements, um, the um, government gave consideration to expected increases in production, um, including the possibility of new entrants. Um, that's not specific to particular kinds of facilities or particular kinds of activities. That's true across the board. I'm going to share the call. Senator uh, David Pocock uh, has indicated. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, one of the things we heard during the uh, Senate committee um, from a number of um, people, in including the Australian Workers' Union National Secretary General uh, Walton, uh, who we've heard um, a lot about in uh, Committee of the Whole so far, was that there is a need for a carbon border adjustment mechanism. My understanding is the government has committed to consultation on a CBAM. Um, I'm just interested, what is a realistic timeline for implementation of a CBAM? Uh, should the consultation show that this um, is something that has widespread support? Minister. I was just seeking clarity about some of the particulars of the review, Senator Pocock. Um, the, um, so you're right, the government has committed to initiating a review of CBAM arrangements um, with particular focus on um, cement and steel, although not exclusively on those things. Um, we would expect, uh, I'm advised, a 12 to 18 month process. Um, to examine uh, that issue. Senator Brockman. Just on this same issue, um, the, the CBAMs, I mean, how, Minister, how, how does the government not, by going down this path, and I'm not saying you've committed to it, but um, you know, we've, we know overseas jurisdictions are seriously considering it, how does it not turn into a modern form of tariff? Minister. Uh, I imagine that these are questions that could be contemplated as part of a review. Senator Cash. Do you mind if I could, just, and, and thank you very much, Minister. Could I just change to another topic? I've just got a discreet set of questions in relation to lithium mining. Um, just in terms of lithium miners, just so I have absolute clarity, Will they be impacted by the changes to the safeguard mechanism? I'm happy for you to seek advice from the. But Minister. Uh, Senator Cash, uh, the sort of entry point for a facility to become a covered facility is. 100,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide or equivalents in a year. And that is the same as the arrangements that were in place um, under the previous government. So it depends on the particular nature of the operation. And I'm advised that there are a number of facilities uh, which are covered at the moment. Senator so is, yes, they could be covered. I understand that. So can I just um, get you to guarantee, though, that no lithium miner will be worse off under the changes? Minister. Uh, Senator Cash, amongst the many virtues of proceeding down this reform path is our ability to provide certainty for a range of entities that seek to make investments in Australia. Um, that anyone who is making an investment at the moment, I think, already understands that uh, 
whether as a consequence of international markets or uh, the investor community or of regulatory arrangements or some other pressure, they will be required to move to a low carbon um, arrangement. What the implementation of these reforms will do is give anyone seeking to make a decision some measure of certainty about what the government of Australia expects of them in contributing to our transformation uh, to a low carbon economy. Senator Cash. And, and thank you for that answer. So, based on that answer, a person or a lithium miner could be worse off, despite they would at least have knowledge of what the government wants them to do and certainty in that regard, in terms of their ability to undertake this process if they're impacted, they could be worse off than they currently are. Minister. Senator Cash, I'm not going to speculate about hypotheticals. It's just not possible for me to respond to a hypothetical of this nature. <clears throat> Senator Cash. I'd be concerned that lithium miners in Australia are considered hypothetical situations. Um, they'd be very interested to know that. Um, in, in terms of lithium mining itself, um, lithium miners or some companies are being provided with a subsidy or grant of support through other measures uh, provided by the federal government, and obviously they are aimed at, um, as certainly we had wanted when we were in government, to increase the mining and processing of critical minerals, um, such as lithium, obviously, which supports Australia's energy transition. Um, just in terms of whether or not they're worse off or not, if they're actually currently receiving the grants, the subsidies or support, but they actually are impacted by these changes. So they've been given this grant, this subsidy or support to actually undertake um, the mining and processing of the critical minerals. Is there some way to ensure that they are no worse off as a result of being impacted by the changes? Minister. Uh, Senator Cash, uh, throughout the course of the debate, I have provided information to the Chamber about a range of financial supports that will be available to safeguard participants. Um, I think, and I have also indicated, that the um, rules the program guidelines for those funds are under development in the context of the budget. Senator Cash. Thank you for raising the rules. Um, will there be an exemption in the rules for critical mineral processes if they are supporting our energy transition? Minister. Senator Cash, it's a quite general question. I suppose there are a range of um, characteristics in scheme design which uh, seek to respond to the individual circumstances of particular um, activities. In particular, on Monday, the minister indicated his intention to establish um, a distinct um, test for manufacturing entities that, uh, so as to assess whether or not they would be eligible for an adjusted baseline. Um, so to the extent that uh, people are engaged in activities associated with um, manufacturing, uh, there are some very particular arrangements, but uh, I think your question is very general in nature. Senator Cash. Um, so I'm a little confused as to how um, critical mineral processes is general in nature. I, I do have a very specific question. It might be that you need to come back to the chamber on it, and I'm happy for, for the advisers to take it um, away. In terms of companies that process lithium spondamine concentrate to lithium hydroxide, so this is of concern to some of the companies. Will they, or can you guarantee that they will not be adversely impacted by these changes? So it's quite specific. 
lithium spondamine concentrate to lithium hydroxide? Minister. Indeed, it is very specific, Senator Cash, and I will see what could be provided. Senator Brockman. Um, I just want to go, go back to uh, Senator Pocock's earlier question about the, the comments, particularly from um, the National Farmers Federation, around the impact of a turbocharged offset market. And I understand, and I'll put to one side the, the um, accus, and, and I believe uh, Senator Davey has some questions about those. But in terms of the overall impact on agricultural land, and you talked about the opportunities in carbon farming, and I accept that some in the industry are exploring those ideas, but is there any mechanism in this bill to control or oversight the purchase of farmland by the entities covered under the safeguard mechanism? Minister. Um, Senator Brockman, I think that this is outside the, the scope of the legislation before us, but I'm advised that at the moment, um, under arrangements established by the previous government, there is a process where the Agriculture Minister um, considers the impact where a uh, ACU project is. Ex uh, uh, sorry, a human-induced regeneration project is established um, on, in such a way as to occupy more than 30 per cent is the benchmark um, of agricultural land, of a piece of agricultural land, of a farm. Senator Brockman. Yes, but, 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 but my understanding, I could be wrong, Minister, but my understanding is that that will be captured if, if a, an, a carbon unit is involved. But if a mining company or a big oil and gas company buys up a piece of farm agricultural land and uses it as a direct offset, is there anything in this legislation or other government bills in planning that would capture that? Minister. I think, Senator Brockman, um, I'd refer you to some of the advice that I did provide um, Senator Pocock. I mean, we are conscious that um, the development of a market for carbon and carbon sequestration um, prevent, presents an opportunity for landholders. And uh, you're quite right that landholders may choose to realise that in different ways, and you contemplate the possibility of sale as one of those options. I think uh, the Chubb review gave some consideration to this and recommended um, that the government continue to support um, individuals and communities in their engagement um, with that process, and we're working through how to implement that. I, th I made reference to a specific program that provides individual advice. Uh, I understand the sort of broader question I think you're alluding to. I think that that is something that the government is alive to, but this bill is not uh, a place where this is being pursued. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, but uh, I think why it's important that the government should be alive to this and, quite frankly, this should be covered uh, in this bill is that farmland has been valued on the basis of agricultural production for thousands of years. And that has been the baseline of what farmland is worth. Here's a piece of land. How much agricultural produce can I sustainably draw from this land? Um, we've also got a long-term process in the agricultural sector where efficiency gains and modernising and, and uh, different uh, agricultural methodologies have meant that uh, being able to purchase your next-door neighbour has been essential to agricultural survival in the long term. Now, 
I think it's fair to say, Minister, isn't well, no, I'll ask you the question. This completely changes the economic dynamics and valuation of agricultural land. And by saying what you just said, you're effectively agreeing with that. Minister. Uh, Senator Brockman, I was uh, reflect <laughs> listening reflectively to your contribution and trying to indicate that I was engaging in a serious way with what you're putting to me. I suppose part of the thing that might influence your thinking on this is that the creation of, uh, well, the enhanced carbon sequestration on a property is not incompatible with continuing agricultural production. In fact, there are plenty of places where that is taking place right now. Um, it's also not the only alternative use for agricultural land, and if we think about some of the pressures on agricultural land, they are widespread and diverse. Um, and you know, it is an ongoing and general question that a country ought to be thinking about carefully. Um, but I do think, uh, you know, you, you are assuming that these things are mutually exclusive, and in many examples, they are not. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Chair. With due respect, I'm not assuming that they're mutually exclusive, but they've been done on the basis that uh, a, a, a valuation of carbon is an adjunct to an existing agricultural enterprise. This risks taking that equation and completely wiping it out on the back of companies wishing to survive, having to achieve certain obligations not being able to do it within the timeframes required through technological means and therefore being left with no option if there's no technological solution. The only meaningful, viable, realistic option for them is to buy up agricultural land and lock it up. And that has flow-on impacts to communities right across regional Australia. It has flow-on impacts to, to, to uh, agricultural industries. Uh, as agricultural industries are made smaller, their, their economies of scale decline, and the chance of uh, uh, those industries folding altogether becomes much, much more realistic. Uh, and this is not a hypothetical. This is happening in regional WA at the moment, where uh, large entities are buying up agricultural land, uh, land effectively to lock it up. Minister. Uh, Senator Brockman, I think uh, I see the scenario that you are pointing to. Um, I don't know that there is evidence of this happening at the moment. Um, there is a review uh, scheduled for um, the arrangements that are proposed here, uh, I think in 25, uh, 26 actually, um, in 2026. These are matters that could be considered um, and would be raised by submitters who had concerns at that time. Senator Brockman. I'll, I'm happy to give, share the call to somebody else. I, this will be my last question for now. But, uh, so, did you have any submissions on this bill that asked for this issue to be addressed? Minister. Thank you. The officials are checking about the submissions, um, but I indicated some clicks back that this was a matter that was contemplated as part of the Chubb review. Um, Prof uh, Professor Chubb made recommendations about this, um, and so the implementation of the Chubb review goes to this question. There, is, there are also other pathways in the specific context of the legislation before us for these issues to be raised as part of any review. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. Minister, when was the regulatory impact statement undertaken?
Minister. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, Senator Macdonald, I'm advised that the bill creates a framework and it would be the rulemaking under that framework that had the regulatory impact. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. So this uh, regulatory framework um, has been identified by the 250 large emitters as having uh, financial imposts upon them. They have been able to identify that based on the framework that's identified to this date, um, just on the back of an envelope of what I've been told so far. We are talking at least hundreds of millions of dollars. And, but your answer is, is that there has not been a regulatory impact statement undertaken. Senator Macdonald. Oh, my apologies, Chair. Um, Senator Macdonald, I'm merely pointing you to the requirements um, that are placed on governments or that governments place on themselves. It is the rulemaking process that would engage the requirement for such, a, such an assessment. Senator Macdonald. So this is uh, our, the, the 215 high admitters that have been identified are some of the big, biggest taxpayers and employers in Australia. They ensure that Australians have well-paid jobs. But you're telling me that the government has not done a broad framework of modelling of any description to identify the cost of Australian industries and potentially the cost on Australian jobs. I just want to clarify this because I think this is a very serious uh, matter for Australia. Minister. Senator Macdonald, this is essentially the same question that was asked of me by Senator Dunningham. It was then asked of me by Senator Hughes. It's a question that uh, the nature of the analysis that's been undertaken in support of the bill has also been canvassed in Senate estimates. It was canvassed in the Senate committee that examined this legislation. I don't have anything further to the answers that I've already provided the chamber. Senator Macdonald, did you want to continue? Thank you, Chair. I will just finish on this statement then that uh, I think this is an exceptional flaw in the modelling of this proposal, this policy, that if I can tell you um, that this will be at a bare minimum hundreds of millions of dollars impost in taxes from our most successful and high paying taxing industries and, and employers, and the government has not done any modelling, uh, I think this is a massive flaw in this policy, and I can only imagine the views of, of the government in opposition, how they would have held us to task for having failed to have done this. Uh, and so I appreciate that you believe you've told something to Senator Dunningham and Senator Hughes, but industry um, and, and people who rely on these companies I think are pretty shocked to discover that there has not been specific modelling around this framework that identify the cost to Australia and Australian businesses. Minister. Senator Macdonald, I have indicated in answers to previous questions the nature of the analysis that has been undertaken. Your characterisation is incorrect and I will point out again that the the process of developing this policy has been done in very close consultation with a very wide range of stakeholders over an extended period of time. Senator Sullivan. Thank you. Minister, uh, I presume you were listening to Senator Shoebridge's um, speech earlier today, his contribution, or earlier this evening. Uh, in, in, his, in his contribution, he talked about the hard cap. Uh, if I understood what he was saying and the connection to uh, another point that he made, which was that 58 projects were not going to proceed uh, based on the implementation of the hard cap. I, I think I've got that right from what he, what he said. You can, you can correct me if you think I might have picked that up wrong. But uh, I'm wondering if you have a list of the 58 projects that won't proceed under this. Minister. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, 
We are grateful for the Greens' willingness to negotiate, to discuss and to provide ideas about how to strengthen the policy that we took to the election. With respect to Senator Shearbridge and his colleagues, uh, we do not accept that characterisation of the effect of the policy. Um, so I will run through the amendment that we do in fact propose. It is that net emissions, which include offsets by implication, must not, must not exceed 1,233 million tonnes uh, between 2022 uh, to 2930, and that aggregate emissions must reduce over time. Um, it does not change the elemental design feature of the proposal we've put forward, uh, which is to allow for new entrants and also to allow for expansion of production of existing covered entities. Um, with respect to colleagues, we don't consider that characterisation accurate. Senator O'Sullivan. Okay, so there's not a there's not a list of 58 that you have. I, I take it from. Yep. Minister. Uh, I should say also that the arrangements we propose um, set out a set of obligations on the Climate Change Authority, on the Secretary of the Department of Climate Change, and on the Minister to contemplate. Um, what actions might be necessary should it seem that that objective to have a um, decline in emissions over time would not be met. Nothing about those arrangements suggests the cancellation of a particular project or a particular facility. <coughs> Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you for that answer, Minister. Uh, the there are 215, 215 facilities currently captured under the safeguard mechanism, as I understand it. There are about 30 per cent, 66 facilities or projects across Western Australia in my home state. Uh, you know, 30 per cent is a big chunk, considering we make up 6.9 per cent of the, uh, of the population, us good Western Australians. Um, are there, uh, can you guarantee? That there won't be, that because of the changes that have been uh, implemented as part of this bill, and indeed that the amendments that have been agreed to with the Greens, uh, can you guarantee that there won't be projects that would have otherwise been viable to get up, particularly in Western Australia, uh, that would have otherwise been viable would now no longer be viable? Can you guarantee that that's not the case, Minister? Sorry, Senator, I just had that moment of having been awake for quite a long time. Let me pause and gather my thoughts. Um, so the decline rate that's been established, um, the, the bill anticipates establishing a baseline for each of the covered facilities and then establishing a decline rate for them, which in the ordinary course of things would be 4.9 per cent annually, but under certain circumstances might be reduced, and we canvass these in discussions with other, other colleagues. Um, the proposed decline rate includes explicit consideration of emissions from new developments. Um, consistent with the way that we treat those in our emissions projections that are already produced by government uh, each year. And so new developments include new facilities, backfill projects and expansions. Um, as I have tried to indicate to you in my earlier answer, the arrangements that are being put in place today don't alter that. What they do do is establish a requirement that if uh, that on occasions when the environment minister 
uh, makes an approval that will increase the emissions from a um, covered facility, that that information is automatically transferred to the Secretary of the Department of Climate Change, uh, to the Minister uh, and to the Climate Change Authority. Now, that transfer of information, as you probably would understand, would occur in many instances anyway. This formalises it as a requirement uh, on the Minister for the Environment. And under certain circumstances, if the Climate Change Authority or the Secretary of the Department considers that, um, on receipt of that information, that we are at risk of not meeting the objects of the Act, which are to reduce emissions, uh, they must make that analysis available to the minister, who must then set in train some steps to try and remedy it. And those steps could be a change to the overall rule, or they could be some other step that the minister considers necessary to achieve the objects of the Act. Uh, nothing about that alters the way that the Minister for the Environment would provide approvals. Uh, nothing about that provides a capacity for the minister for climate change to stop or halt a project. I think it's important to be quite clear about that. Senator Macdonald. Just to follow on uh, to that uh, line of questioning, Minister, did the government flag with overseas trading partners the likelihood of a number of new offshore developments not proceeding due to safeguard mechanism imposts, thus threatening future contracts and supply? Minister. Well, we haven't, because that's not our expectation. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. I have a, a few questions. I want to come back to the issue of um, land use conflicts and the concerns raised by the um, National Farmers Federation. Uh, Minister, earlier in one of your answers to um, Senator Brockman, you mentioned <coughs> the ministerial veto for projects whereby um, human-induced regeneration may exceed 30 per cent of the farm, um, as you rightly pointed out. <coughs> Sorry, we, um, we bought that in the ministerial veto in when we were in government in response to industry concerns. Uh, so do I take it from your answer that um, that there will be no change to that 30 per cent ministerial veto um, in, in that legislation? Minister. Senator Davey, may I ask you just to clarify the pointy part of your question? I heard the preamble. I'm just not quite sure what you're asking. Uh, Senator so, Davey. Thank you. Sorry, um, Chair. The concern that has been put to me by industry is that um, that ministerial veto, 30 per cent, and I understand it's under another minister, um, but the concern is that that will now be removed to enable large-scale um, human-induced regeneration offsets under, to, to satisfy the demands that will be created by this safeguard mechanism. Minister. Uh, Senator Davey, that is, not the that is not the subject of the legislation before us. Um, can I also indicate that uh, we've had some discussion uh, with a number of senators, and I thank you all for your questions and your engagement, uh, about the uh, concerns as they are expressed. I think it's important to be um, clear about what is actually um, being what the position of the National Farmers Federation is. Um, they have, as you've indicated, um, raised questions around the interaction between the safeguard mechanism and farms, but they have said um, we need to find the balance between delivering carbon offsets and meeting our global food and fibre demands. Importantly, this also means supporting farmers to make informed business decisions about their participation in carbon markets. That's why we're calling for greater investment in on-ground extension services. I think that's a very constructive approach from the NFF 
Um, and as I've indicated to other senators, uh, a first step in our thinking about the recommendations that came from, to us from Professor Chubb is the implementation of ad arrangements for on-ground advice. Uh, and that program was funded, I think, in the last budget. Senator Davey. Um, thank you, and uh, thank you very much, Minister. I appreciate that you've mentioned <coughs> the Chubb review a couple of times tonight, and um, I'm glad you have, because um, I have real concerns about the deal struck with the Greens relating to the Australian carbon credit units and human-induced regeneration. Uh, as you've quite rightly pointed out, uh, farmers very much understand the climate is changing. They live the reality every day. From droughts to flooding rains, they manage their lands. Every farmer wants to find that balance. Commodity group after commodity group are working towards net zero. Um, and they know it's not only good for the planet, but it's also really good for their market access. Um, but when we uh, that's, that's why farmers have actually embraced the exchange of human-induced regeneration projects within reason, within a percentage of their land on, uh, as ACCUs. But now we see the risk through this backroom deal that you've done with the Greens to get their flawed policy through this place. Because when the Greens, later, uh, Greens announced their deal with the government, Adam Bant said, and I quote, the agreement will significantly improve the integrity of ACCUs with a freeze on the most dubious offset class, human-induced regeneration, until they're subject to an independent audit. However, as you've mentioned, we've already had the Chubb review, um, and in Minister Bowen's press release, he did not mention anything about a freeze. So, who do we believe, Minister? Do we believe the Greens or do we believe um, that the ACCUs will not change? Minister. Um, thanks very much, Senator Davey. Um, and I have canvassed this um, <coughs> reasonably extensively earlier in the day. Um, the commitment we've provided in the over the last few days um, is very specific and relates very directly to the Chubb review. It relates even more specifically to recommendation eight from Professor Chubb. And that recommendation essentially sets out, makes a set of observations about how the um, test associated with the human re uh, induced regeneration method ought to be applied. Um, we have made clear that we expect that method and that interpretation to be considered in issuing any new credits to projects established under the human induced regeneration uh, method. And we expect that the way that that would happen would be in the ordinary process by which project proponents approach the clean energy regulator and seek to have the credits allocated on the basis of activities undertaken under the project. Um, I hope that makes it clear we wouldn't characterise it in quite the same way as, as you've described just now. I am going to go to um, Senator Walsh. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for the call. Um, and, uh, Minister, there's been um, a lot of questions um, from those, those opposite and, and concern today about the impact um, of our reforms on um, the business community. Uh, and I understand that there's actually been um, considerable um, support for the government's safeguard mechanism policy design um, from um, business advocates uh, and that uh, there's considerable support um, on the record. Um, for example, um, from the BCA, uh, Jennifer Westacott uh, said um, about these safeguard uh, reforms, my message to all involved uh, is let's pass this bill. She also said 
uh, let's get it done. Let's get some momentum so that we can get this big investment change happening. Uh, and there were um, similar comments, um, similar endorsement um, from Andrew McKellar uh, of Aki. Uh, and he said, uh, and I quote, the business community has been very clear in its support for reforms to the safeguard mechanism. This is the best way to secure the planning, investment and innovation that will underpin the decarbonisation of our economy without sacrificing reliability or affordability. Um, there was also um, considerable support uh, on the record um, from the uh, Australian Industry Group, um, the AIG. Um, Mr Willocks said, um, while debate over the detail of the reformed safeguard mechanism will continue, the crediting bill before parliament is essential policy infrastructure essential policy infrastructure, uh, and it is strongly in everyone's interest to pass it. Uh, and again, um, Mr Willocks said it is time for the parliament to come to a workable agreement uh, on the current package of safeguard mechanism reforms so that the private and public sectors can get on with the transition to uh, a net zero emissions economy. Um, and uh, I note further I note further the comments um, that were actually made uh, just yesterday I think I think yesterday was the 28th of March it's been a bit of a time space uh, vortex in here recently uh, but I think these comments were made yesterday uh, from manufacturing Australia on the 28th of March uh, and uh, those comments of course, uh, take into account all of the, the debate that's been happening over the last few days. Uh, and Manufacturing Australia said these changes are sensible and pragmatic. It's now vital uh, that we get the details and the implementation right to enable the multi-decade investments that are needed to underpin low emissions manufacturing. Um, so it's great, of course, to hear that support um, from our manufacturing sector um, as recently uh, as yesterday, that the changes are sensible, they're pragmatic, it's vital uh, that we continue now with the implementation phase and get that right um, so that industry can get on with the long-term investment uh, that they need um, to transform to, transform to, to low-emissions manufacturing. Um, and of course, it's not just uh, in the manufacturing uh, sector that we've seen uh, this uh, support um, from, from business, from industry. Um, I've also seen uh, comments uh, that uh, I wanted uh, your reaction to, uh, Minister, um, from uh, Glencore CEO um, Gary Nagel. Uh, and he said, um, we are committed to reducing our total emissions scope one, two uh, and three uh, by 15 per cent by 2026 and 50 per cent by 2035. Uh, and both of those figures are on um, 2019 levels. Um, post, uh, 30, post 2035, um, Mr Nagel went on to say, um, our ambition is to achieve net zero total emissions by 2050 with um, a supportive um, a supportive policy environment. Uh, and of course, we've heard today um, figures about just how many uh, of the uh, businesses that are covered by uh, the reformed safeguard mechanism do already have those net uh, zero uh, total emissions um, targets by, by 2050, and Glencore um, is clearly um, one of those. Um, and their website explains it um, really well. Uh, the website says, we aim to be a net zero total emissions company by 2050. Um, this means we're not only reducing the direct emissions from our own operations, scope one and scope two emissions, um, but also those created from the use of our products, so scope three emissions. Um, so fantastic to see the great um, ambition uh, there from uh, Glencore uh, and the support uh, that they have um, for the safeguard me mechanism uh, and their desire to see a supportive um, policy environment that gives them the, the certainty that they need uh, 
uh, for their business to go forward. Um, and of course, we've also had on the on the record support from the Minerals Council of Australia. Um, Ms. Constable said um, back in uh, February um, to uh, to the Senate inquiry, uh, speaking about um, where the mining industry uh, is at um, with reducing emissions. She said um, the mining industry recognises that there is a very big task that is required to reduce emissions. And we've been on that path for a long time. Um, the minerals industry uh, has signed on to net zero um, by 2050. Um, so again, um, they're already uh, well on the way um, and looking for the sort of certainty and stability um, of the types of reforms uh, that the government um, is putting forward uh, this week uh, in the Senate. Uh, and she uh, went on to say, um, you know, we've made that target, and then she went on to say, we've not been sitting on our hands waiting for policy change. We've been making that change over time. In 2020, the Minerals Council of Australia and its members released our first climate action plan. Uh, and since that time, we've reported on an annual rolling basis our activities across the industry. It's been measured, Ms Constable uh, says. Um, and it's been recorded. Uh, Minerals Council of Australia members have around 39 separate activities that go from fuel switching, um, changing out of current energy sources to new energy sources, autonomous operations, renewable energy, battery storage, digitisation, um, a whole range of issues on site and in our headquarters, so across all of our operations. Um, that is ongoing, she says, and it will continue to be ongoing. It's a hard task, um, but every member, um, she says, of the Minerals Council is taking action. Um, so it is, of course, um, tremendous to see that level of support from the business community um, for these uh, safeguard reforms. Um, again, you know, the BCA's uh, Jennifer Westacott saying, let's get on and, and pass this bill. Uh, Aki saying the business community has been very clear in its support for the safeguard mechanism uh, and it's the way forward for decarbonising our economy. Um, the AIG uh, saying that of course there will be implementation questions, of course there will be detail questions, um, but this is essential policy infrastructure, the AIG says. Uh, and they say that it is time for the parliament to come to a workable agreement, um, which is what, uh, what we're here to do, of course, this week uh, in the parliament. Uh, and again, of course, as recently um, as yesterday, taking on board all of the debates that have been happening in the parliament uh, and around the parliament, Manufacturing Australia saying these changes are sensible and pragmatic. Uh, and of course, um, that's what we aim to be uh, as we get on with the job of delivering uh, net zero uh, by 2050 and reducing um, our emissions over the next several years to 2030 um, as well. Um, so, uh, Minister, um, what type of support does the, the proposed uh, safeguard mechanism have um, from, from the business community? Minister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President, and thank you, Senator Walsh, for that very comprehensive um, uh, discussion of what the business community actually thinks about the safeguards mechanism. Because, and I think it was refreshing to hear a contribution um, that actually put on the record what the business community actually has to say and actually thinks about the safeguards mechanism to counter um, the, the sort of fear campaign that we've not just seen over the last couple of days from the opposition, but that sadly we've seen for basically the best part of 10 years. Um, because as, as you've made clear, Senator Walsh, from those comments that you've referred to from uh, groups as wide ranging as the Business Council of Australia, the Australia, Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Australian Industry Group, the Minerals Council of Australia, Glencore, uh, and others, Manufacturing Australia. I mean, let's face it; these are not these are not organisations that have necessarily always seen eye to eye with the Labor Party. But when it comes to 
taking sensible action on climate change, uh, which is designed to build and secure businesses and jobs well into the future, uh, then we are on the same page with these business organisations. Because, like them, we know and we understand the science um, that tells us that we do need to take action on climate change. Uh, we understand that investors are increasingly seeking these changes to be made. Um, we're not denying the reality of what's happening. We're not continuing to play the stick our head in, our sa in the sand game that has been going on in this country on one side of politics for 10 years. We're actually facing up to the reality um, and putting in place policies in partnership with business that will allow for sensible change and ac action to be taken on climate change while also securing jobs and securing investment well into the future. Um, and the truth is that um, the truth is that allegedly, at least, a commitment to net zero emissions by 2050 is something that is supported by all sides of politics. Although, you know, we know that there are a number of people in the opposition, including Senator Canavan and others, who never really agreed with it. Um, they were sort of bound by this policy that they never really agreed with. But allegedly, allegedly, um, the uh, the opposition supports net zero uh, emissions by 2050. And if it is the case that you support bringing those emissions down by 2050, then it can't be done unless if we reduce emissions from our 215 biggest emitters. And the fact is that for all those in the opposition who have spent all day, all week, all year, all decade pretending that these things can't be done and that it will be the end of the world, the fact is that the very businesses, the very um, representatives of heavy industry who the safeguards mechanism will already applies to, um, are ac taking action on these things already. Um, Rio Tinto, Shell and Alcoa, all heavy emitting uh, companies with heavy emitting facilities that the safeguards mechanism already applies to, because let's remember this was actually a policy dreamed up by the then government, who are now in opposition. All of those companies are all reducing their emissions by 50 per cent by 2030 and net zero by 2050. Um, Fortescue Metals Group, again, a heavy emitting company um, with heavy emitting operations committed to carbon neutrality by 2030. Boral, reducing emissions by 46 per cent by 2030. And you know, the examples that Senator Canavan and others have put up over the last few days about coal mining companies. Well, coal mining companies like Glencore, Anglo-American and BHP all have very detailed net zero commitments. Uh, and in fact, 80 per cent of safeguard businesses, which cover around 86 per cent of safeguard emissions, have a commitment to net zero. Now, I, as Senator Canavan knows, I spend a lot of time in central Queensland, as does Senator Chisholm. And unlike, unlike Senator Canavan, when we're in central Queensland, we actually open our eyes to what is already happening in these areas. And it, it doesn't really it doesn't really work for Senator Canavan to deal in the real world and to open his eyes and to see what's actually happening in central Queensland because we all know that he's got this narrative that he's got to feed into Sky After Dark and to his, you know, all these websites and all these bots that, that follow him because we know that's all that really motivates him. Um, and it doesn't really f f suit his narrative or the LNP's narrative in Queensland to actually see that facilities like Boyan Smelter, uh, the Yarwin facility in Gladstone, uh, which again Senator Chisholm and I have spent a lot of time in, probably more than Senator Canavan actually, he doesn't, he doesn't like to go to the facilities that are doing these things. He prefers to wander around Rocky and central Queensland whipping up fear but never setting foot in the facilities that are making these changes, because that would require him and others to actually acknowledge the reality that these companies are already doing these things. If you actually go to Boyan Smelter, um, operated by Rio Tinto, or if you actually go to the Yarwin facility just outside Gladstone, operated by Rio Tinto, as, and, and Senator Canavan, as I say, doesn't like to go and set foot in these premises because he'd have to actually listen to what's going on. But if you actually bother to go there, as Senator Chisholm, Senator Green and Senator I have on a regular basis, what they will tell the Prime Minister on a regular basis, what they will tell you 
is that at Boyne Smelter, Rio Tinto is already undertaking work about how they can increasingly rely on renewable energy to power their operations that produce aluminium. If you actually go to Yarwin, uh, the alumina refinery that Rio Tinto operates just outside Gladstone, they are already uh, um, trialling the use of hydrogen as a replacement for gas. And guess who helped them fund that? It was actually the former government. It was actually the former government, the LNP government, who said they didn't support these things but was on the side providing money to the companies to do the exact same thing. Um, if you go to the gas plants on Curtis Island outside, uh, at Gladstone, um, you'll, they will tell you about the work they're doing to reduce their emissions, to reduce their flaring. If you actually go to the coal mines in central Queensland, they will tell you about the work they're doing to reduce their emissions. Um, and I know that doesn't work for Senator Canavan, and I know it doesn't work for the National Party um, to actually go oh, and talk oh, to the no. workers. It, it actually doesn't, if you actually go to the Calide Power Station at Biloela and you talk to the workers, they all know the future is changing. I mean, Senator McKenzie, you would never have stepped foot in, stepped foot in any of these places um, to actually go. You would never have been to any of them and understand what's going on. Um, but you're all very happy to come down here and pontificate about what workers in central Queensland want. Well, if you actually go to Calide Station, Power Order. Station, and talk to the workers, they tell you that they know Order. the future is changing. They know things are changing. Senator White, Senator White Minister, just resume your seat. Three times I quietly asked for order. You looked me in the eye and screamed louder. So if you want to carry on like that, I'll sit here all night with saying nothing. Doesn't worry me because it is disorderly and you actually are being quite rude. The minister will be heard in silence. Minister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And as I was saying, if you actually bother to turn up and go to Boyne Smelter, go to Yarwin, go to the gas plants, go to the coal mines across central Queensland, all these places where apparently this can't be done, it's going to be the end of the world, what the management and the workers will tell you when you go there is that they are already doing these things. So it doesn't, I know it doesn't help. I know, I know Senator Canavan, Senator McKenzie, other members of the Liberal and National Party in Queensland uh, would much prefer to pretend that this thing isn't happening already and that the, the legislation that we're in the process of passing will be the end of the world. This is exactly what is happening right now in these, in these facilities. And at last, our country and places like central Queensland have a government that is acknowledging reality that acknowledges that things are changing and that actually these facilities need a government and need a policy environment that will actually assist them make the changes that they are already making. I mean, the other part of the reforms that we've announced, of course, is what is now $1 billion in financial support uh, that from the federal government to these facilities that are facing international competition. And, and Senator Canavan and Senator McKenzie think it's funny, think it's funny to support companies that want to make these changes so they can lock in, their, their, lock in these jobs. So, Senator, uh, Minister, if you resume your seat. Senator McKenzie on a point of order. Relevance. The fact that Minister Watt stands here and accuses Senator Canavan and I of laughing about the safeguards mechanism and its impact on central Queensland, we're laughing at your answers, Minister, All right, I'll help not you on out, the impacts. Minister, I'll help you out, Senator McKenzie. There is no point of order, Minister. Thank you, Acting President. Well, certainly something we've learned in recent weeks from the opposition is that they really don't like it when we expose what they're saying and what they're doing. All sorts of things happen when we do that, don't they? Um, all sorts of accusations get made when that happens. But you are laughing at the suggestion that a government should be providing, providing financial support to facilities that are facing change so that we can lock in these jobs for the long term. Because these characters over here, who have been holding back progress in places like central Queensland for the last 10 years and are continuing to deny reality, also want to stop support for these companies from locking in jobs in the long term. They would much rather have their political games, their nonsense that they have been carrying on with for 10 years, and actually putting the jobs of these workers at, at risk rather than acknowledging reality and Sir, working with the companies with this change. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll just get clarification. Uh, Senator Canavan, were you taking a point of order? Or you oh, in the call. Oh, okay, you, you've got the call. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, look, first of all, I just, just want to correct the record a little bit about my movements. Um, apparently, Senator Watt uh, is very, very interested in where I travel and go to. And 
I'm a, I'm a little bit of a hopeless romantic uh, because last year I actually took my wife to 17 coal mines in four days. Uh, we had a great time travelling around central Queensland. So the idea I don't go to these facilities, I don't talk to these workers. Uh, actually, uh, I travel there rev regularly and I travel there with my family because we live in central Queensland. We love the place. Uh, we love the people in the place, uh, the wealth it produced for the nation. We never get enough gratitude. And I didn't hear one word from Senator Watt there, one word in, in his long screed against um, myself and how evil I am and terrible we all are on this side. Did not hear one word of thanks to the people of central Queensland. One word of gratitude. His whole budget is basically, the Labor Party's budget is basically being uh, bankrolled at the moment by the hard work of the men and women in the coal industry and, and other resource industries, but especially coal over the last year. It's our nation's biggest export again. And, and not a single word. We never hear it from the Labor Party. Never, they never say thanks to the people who work in this industry. Well, I just want to put on the record at the start of my contribution, I thank you. I thank those workers for what they do for our nation. They spend long periods of the year away from their families often because they're in remote locations, living in a donga, uh, you know, without anyone to sleep next to at night. Uh, um, uh, but their work, their work helps us uh, be the prosperous and, and, uh, and rich nation that we are. So I just want to put on the record, I thank them. Uh, I wish the Labor Party could be bipartisan about this, but they just simply se can't seem to recognise the achievements of the coal industry. You never hear them say anything about how, what an achievement it's been uh, to open up a new coal basin for the first time in 50 years in the Galilee. Uh, the Adani project. We fought tooth and nail against a bunch of radical greenies uh, funded by globalists to try and stop that. And the Labor Party never says a single word about it, never, never welcomes it. You never hear them mention it. Uh, why not? Are they not proud of the coal industry? Are they not proud of the 2,000 uh, central and north Queenslanders at work at the Adani Carmichael mine? Do they care about their futures at all? Because you, you never hear them talk about them. It's all about us. They want to talk about the coalition, how terrible we are. Well, I, I just want to put on record how important the coal industry is in this country and how proud I am to support and fight for it. Um, I also just I thought I was going to go to some other places, but I thought it's also important after that uh, uh, particularly partisan screed from uh, Minister Watt. Uh, he really should be above that now. He's a minister. But it's important to put on the record that the actual positions of uh, yeah, businesses in the coal sector, especially uh, after the sell-outs that the Labor Party has engaged in this week for workers' interests to the Greens. Uh, they have absolutely sold out the interests of those who work in the coal and the gas and, and other mining sectors as well, which I'm sure I'll get a chance to come to tonight. But uh, as a result of that sell-out deal, uh, here's just a few quotes, some actual quotes uh, from, uh, from, from uh, companies uh, in the coal industry today. This deal has only happened in the last couple of days, of course. We still don't have a lot of basic details about it. Uh, I asked a question about the impact on on, uh, on the, on the uh, Olive Downs mine uh, in question time the other day. No answers and still no answers about whether or not the 500 people who work at that mine today, work at that mine tonight, do they still have a job? Where's, where's the certainty for them? So here's a few quotes today reported in the, the Australian. First of all, Paul Flynn from Whitehaven Coal, a great Australian company, uh, has done remarkable things, especially uh, in, around Narrabri in northern New South Wales. Uh, it's a fantastic coal mine, another one I've been to, Murray. It's uh, one of the best in the country, actually. It's special. Go, go and check that out. Um, Paul, Paul Flynn says that nearly 70 per cent of Japan's thermal coal imports come from Australia, so it exposes them to a material new risk in terms of security of energy supply. This is his view about the deal with uh, the Labor Party's deal with the Greens. In the midst of a global shortage of energy and considering alternative technologies aren't ready to pick up the slack from the 80 per cent of primary energy derived from fossil fuels today, it is mind-boggling the government has entertained these concessions. That's what the coal industry thinks, Minister Watt, or well, through you, Chair. Minister Watt, that's, that's, that's what they think. He didn't mention or address Paul Flynn's uh, concerns and his contribution. Going on, Bowen Coke and Coal Chief Executive Nick Jaws, another great Australian. These people are just fantastic Australians. They work hard, uh, they take risks, uh, they're just great people, uh, the larrikins. Nick Jaws, um, he said that Labor was enter, enter, entering, and I quote, extremely dangerous and uncharted territory with a, quote, carbon tax by stealth that would limit Australia's high-quality, low-emission coal exports. That's what the coal industry has said today, Minister Watt, and maybe in your next partisan screed, and less, instead of focusing so much on myself uh, or how terrible I am, uh, maybe, maybe respond to Mr Jorce. He's actually an investor in the built, built amazing businesses in the coal industry. Um, respond to him. So why is he wrong? Because Mr Jorce goes on to say that global demand Global coal demand, sorry, is at the highest level in history. He's right about that. 
And it's fanciful to think that reducing our high quality exports in the face of record demand will do anything other than drive up energy and steel prices, create a net increase in global emissions and destroy Australian jobs both in regions and cities. Mr George doesn't sound too supportive of the government's measures. Apparently, Mr Minister Watt uh, is mis wants to mislead the Senate um, uh, because he doesn't, does not recognise the comments there of Mr George. I move on. New Hope Group, another business that's been totally screwed over by Labor governments for over many years. Uh, finally got their project approval after what, 12 years. New Hope Group Chief Executive Rob Bishop said the amendments were built on, and I quote, a political objective on a base demonisation of fossil fuels, and that they would see Australia abandon its role as a reliable energy exporter for the region. More, 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 more criticism uh, from the coal industry that Minister Watt has failed to address uh, in any of his contributions. The president of Peabody's Australian Operations, Jamie Frankcombe, said the company was concerned the legislation would, and I quote, make the mining industry less competitive at a time when it's integral to providing the minerals and energy required for the energy transition. No, where's the support here? Where's it? <laughs> no support. Um, uh, Mr Frankham goes on to say the very real danger in setting aspirational emission reduction targets and impose, imposing rigid rules to achieve them is that it will reduce our cost competitors, lead to potential job losses and hurt regional communities. Those, those communities, Mr Watt, that you fly in and fly out of, you don't actually live there. Uh, a spokesman for Glencore said the reforms needed to achieve emissions reductions without destroying the jobs and investments that are critical to the national economy. And it goes on and on. There's more comments from the gas industry too, which I'll perhaps get to later uh, this evening. But I also, um, before I get to some more detailed questions, just put into context here what we're doing. Uh, I sort of got to a little bit of this in my second reading speech, but I just want to compare here. You know, we're putting all these costs and risks on the, on, on the coal and other industries. It's been outlined in concerns there that I've quoted. And the benefit we're going to do uh, in this bill, uh, the government's own target in, in their own papers, their position paper on the safeguard mechanism, says that they will abate or reduce, uh, get rid of the jargon, they'll reduce carbon emissions by 205 million tonnes. That's, that's how much they'll achieve. OK, well, it sounds like a lot. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, on March 13th, actually, uh, this year, March 13th this year, the Biden administration approved uh, the Willow project in Alaska. It will produce 180,000 barrels of oil a day, and it is going to produce a total of 263 million tonnes of emissions. Just that one project, one project. So we spent all this time this week. We're going to be here to, I don't know, God knows what hour again tonight. Lauding ourselves, how fantastic we are! Uh, you know, the tides are not rising anymore. The temperature is falling. We can already feel it getting colder. Uh, we're apparently shifting the world here in this little room. We, um, all we're going to do, after all this effort, after all of this uh, uh, uncertainty we impose on the major industries that bankroll our nation, we will reduce our emissions by 205 million tonnes. Meanwhile, one decision of the so-called a climate conscious democratic elected Biden administration, one decision completely blows out the water everything we've done. And more, and more. 263 million tonnes uh, from that one decision in Alaska. And I've, I've searched, and it doesn't seem like Conoco Phillips, who are the uh, proponents of the Willow project, uh, they used to invest in Australia too, they largely don't anymore, they're sold out of Darwin, unfortunately, so we've lost them. But Conoco Phillips released to the Stock Exchange in New York and welcomed the decision from Houston. You know what? In their whole media release <laughs> announcing the, the Willow project, not a single, emission, single mention of carbon emissions. Not a single mention. No mention of offsetting them or, or netting, getting to net zero. Not a single mention. You know what they did mention, though, which, again, Sir Minister Watt failed to mention his contribution at all. What they did mention, what they did mention is that this is what Conoco Phillips said. Willow fits the Willow project, that is, I mentioned. Willow fits within the Biden administration's priorities on environmental and social justice, facilitating the energy transition and enhancing our energy security, all while creating good union jobs. Good union jobs. That's what the coal industry provides. And I back those unions, and I stand with the CFMEU supporting the industries. These guys don't. They never mention it. Where, the, where is the mention of the union jobs here that you're going to destroy uh, through these policies? Because if you don't, if we have the reaction we've seen, from the coal industry, we don't get the investment. We're not going to get those good union jobs. They'll go to Alaska. They'll go to the Middle East. They'll go to China. They'll go to uh, they'll go to, to to Russia, and they won't be here in this country anymore. So I don't care how much you criticise me. I will keep fighting for those good union jobs because you're not. Uh, Senator Cox. Chair, um, 
I foreshadow that I will move amendments on sheet uh, 1920, standing in my name when the time comes. But I want to take the opportunity to outline those amendments now. Um, as the legislation currently stands, uh, this very broad power under section 33 of the Industrial Research and Development Act gives various ministers the power to make grants on wide grounds. So as long as they are within the legislative power of the Commonwealth, they can throw as much money as they want at it. And this provision was the pipeline that the Morrison government used to throw cash at its gas-fired recovery. But this amendment, which I understand has the support of the Senate, uh, will turn that tap off. For money, uh, money for the purposes of subsidising coal and gas extraction will now be prohibited. This is one less pool of money that the fossil fuel industry can dip their greedy little hands into. And the previous government uh, actually gave money through this provision to hand $50 million to frack the Beedaloo Basin against the wishes of traditional owners. Now, gas companies that made donations to the Liberals and flew together in private jets— I wonder if Senator Mackenzie was part of that jaunt— um, with former Minister Taylor um, received public money under this provision. Empire Energy received $19 million and Tamboran received $7.5 million. But today it's my great pleasure to announce to the Chamber that since the announcement of the package that the Greens negotiated with the government on Monday, the stock value of Tamboran has fallen by 15 per cent and Empire Energy stocks has fallen by 22 per cent. How about that? Now, this Section 33 power was also used to bankroll Listen carefully, Senator Mackenzie. He was used to bankroll the new coal-fired power plant in Collinsville and to fund coal and gas plants in the underwriting new generation investment. So, With the support of this chamber, this amendment will close down such a horrid waste of public money in the future. And We say thank you. The question is, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, Minister, I'm just wondering, and I'm sure you've probably answered this question, unfortunately I've been in other events, but what modelling has the government done and what assurances can the government provide that the impacts of these reforms will be on the economy? Can you guarantee that facilities will be able to meet the requirements and that no facilities will be forced to shut down or jobs lost as a result of the decisions the Senate will make tonight, um, thanks to the government's deal with the Greens? Minister. Uh, Senator Mackenzie, I have answered questions about this matter uh, from Senator Dunningham, from Senator Hughes, from um, uh, Senator Macdonald. I don't have anything further to add to the information I have already provided to the Senate. Senator Mackenzie. Uh, have you provided information to the Senate about the number of jobs lost as a result of this decision? Minister, I think there's some advice being provided to you by the department. Senator Mackenzie, I was giving the minister an opportunity to get that advice and I'll give her the call and I see Senator Stilljohn has his hand up as well. We're waiting for the minister. No, no, no the minister has nothing there. Senator, Senator Stilljohn. Oh. Senator Stilljohn. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, my question to the, to the minister will, uh, will be this. Um, I would like the minister to be able to provide the chamber um, with, with a number of how many times Woodside Energy Group were consulted uh, during the crafting of the original uh, piece of legislation. Now, as a preamble to my question, I want to state clearly for the record and draw the Senate's attention to the reality um, that right now global temperatures are rising and have risen by about 1.2 degrees above their pre-industrial level. And it is very clear from the work of the world's finest climate scientists that with every decade that goes past, every year that goes past, those temperatures continue to rise. Now, the Paris Agreement goal, adopted just eight years ago uh, in 2015, was to limit the global temperature rise uh, to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by the end of the century. We are already, as I say, at 1.2 
degrees Celsius and on track for another 0.2 degrees of warming as we go through this decade. The reality that we are faced with now as a species upon this planet is that with every single year that passes without meaningful action on climate uh, is a year in which we slip closer to an irretrievable climate disaster. What exactly that will mean in real terms is difficult to comprehend when we are already seeing catastrophic once-in-a-generation climate events unfolding at an alarming regularity. These dire straits are reflected in the final part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's uh, sixth annual report released last week. This is the world's official body for the assessment of climate change, telling us in the clearest possible terms, and not for the first time, uh, that we need a rapid, deep, systems-wide emissions reduction programme. The time, as they say, is well and truly up. The climate bomb is uncomfortably close to boom time. In an idealistic view, and I, I say this generously, an idealistic view of the safeguards mechanism bill Labour introduced to the House uh, is that it was an attempt to defuse that bomb. A more realistic view is that this was largely a piece of legislation built on smoke and mirrors, or smoke more precisely as we, uh, as, or would smoke more precisely as we stare down the barrel of another potentially catastrophic La Nina summer this year. Because the bill that Labour originally presented to the House was not in fact a climate bill. By its design it allowed big cashed up polluters to continue business as usual. All that they would need to do would be to find a little bit more cash by making a little bit more money from the next global energy crisis to buy some crappy offsets to offset their big pollution and exceed their allocated level of pollution. By design, Labour's original bill allowed big polluters to offset 100 per cent of their emissions, something many nations economically and ideologically comparable to Australia had made illegal. By design, Labour's original bill allowed big polluters to increase their uh, emissions as long as their number crunchers were good enough at their jobs to make it look otherwise on paper. That's right, under the original bill put forward by Labour, national emissions from coal and gas could go up and were in fact forecast to go up. The government would be able to claim that they had succeeded in reducing national emissions, all thanks to some sly climate accounting. And emissions would of course go up because the government's bill uh, that they originally uh, brought to the House backed in new coal and gas development, some 116 in the pipeline in front of the government right now. Now even by, if by some stroke of magic, the bill in its original form had actually reduced actual emissions, any climate gain would have been completely written off by just one new project alone, the Burrup Hub in my home state of Western Australia. What we see in this reality is a community in Western Australia, forced to take up the fight against these projects directly because they know their government will do nothing more than tinker around the edges on climate policy. One of the members of my team, somebody I am proud to call a colleague, Joanna Partica, recently took up this very fight uh, with her brave protest against Woodside as part of the Disrupt Burrup Hub campaign and I want to pay tribute to that courageous activist group uh, this evening. For her climate activism, uh, like many others engaged in similar actions around the country, Jo is being pursued by the police. She had her home raided by the counter-terrorism police. Now this is the dystopian reality that the government has created. The preeminent global 
climate body sounds the alarm for immediate action and the brave folks responding to that alarm are being, uh, being criminalised. Meanwhile, the government quietly shuffles the papers around, trying not to draw attention to themselves. This reality is created because the government, particularly this Labour government, along with its counterpart at the state level, functions basically as a subsidiary of the fossil fuel industry. Their friends, the oil, uh, the oil and gas barons, masquerade uh, as members upstanding in their nature of the WA community while they play the role as their elected representatives in this place, a thinly veiled front for Woodside, for Rio Tinto and for Chevron. That's the reality of who the Greens have been negotiating with through the course of this process. That is the reality of who the government is up against in this fight. Now, our amendments that the Greens have secured ensure that a real pollution will actually go down. What a radical idea! And not just in paper, not just on paper. The introduction of a hard cap on actual emissions, one that will be ratcheted, ratcheted down over time, is a welcome step, as is uh, secured by our amendments uh, the work to rein in dodgy offsets, ensuring big polluters can't continue to buy their way out of responsibility to abate emissions. Our amendments as a whole, we believe, will place a huge financial burden um, on many of the 100, 116 coal projects in the pipeline of, under the government, making it less likely um, for them to ultimately go ahead. But it is the community's right to know, as this legislation, improved as it has been, is considered before the, before the Senate tonight, how often was Woodside consulted in the crafting of the original piece of legislation. This company, who treats my state of Western Australia as its playground, who has made money from our resources for decades, who happily lends a bit of it out here and there to buy social licence from the creative industries, to put themselves forward to the community as a friend of the community, all the while profiting off the extraction and burning of chemicals and pollutions that ruin our environment. So how often, Minister, were they at the table during the course of the crafting of this legislation? Um, uh, also, my apologies, Chair. May I have the call? Sorry, Chair. Yes, um, Minister. Yes. <laughs> Look, I, I've breached that protocol on more than one occasion this afternoon, so I'm trying to mend my ways. Um, uh, Senator Steele, John, thank you for your contribution. Um, I actually find it disappointing that you've chosen this evening to minimise what's actually a quite important moment for this Parliament. We have had 10 years where the previous government was unable to settle a climate policy and consequently unable to settle an energy policy, and the consequences of that are playing out each and every day for households all over this country and for businesses. And they're playing out for the climate too. And you're quite right to call attention to the IPCC report, and you're quite right <coughs> to point to the fact that this is a critical decade. Actually, the last decade was the critical decade. That was the decade when it would have been good to get on the path to net zero, and regrettably the government that was in place then chose not to do so. Couldn't land a policy amongst themselves. The Nats bickered with the Libs and the outer metropolitan Libs bickered with the inner metropolitan Libs, and nothing happened. It matters a great deal to stabilise climate and energy policy in this country. For the first time we have a parliament where the stated position of a majority of senators and members is for climate action. And we're really proud to have had the opportunity as a government to bring forward meaningful and significant reforms that will put us on a path to net zero, to do the hard work that is necessary to build ambition, to build a global coalition to deal with this problem, which we know can only be tackled by collective global action. And that's our responsibility, and it's our responsibility as a government, and I would put it to you that it is our responsibility as a parliament. 
And the shame about the way that you approached your contribution, and I'm sorry, I don't, I don't wish to scold you, Senator Skildron, but I do wish to point out our, our differences in approach. We are grateful for the very constructive engagement that we had with your leader and with your party room. And we think it's important that people of goodwill can work together across the parliament, and we are genuinely grateful for it. And I do wish to acknowledge that. You've asked me a question, and I will get to that. Uh, I've spoken on many occasions, and some of the people who've been in the chamber for much of this afternoon might be a little bit um, tired of this explanation. But one of the things about stabilising climate policy and establishing an enduring and durable policy solution is working with stakeholders, working with stakeholders across the board. And we make absolutely no apologies for having met with as many of the participants in the existing safeguard mechanism as possible. And it was a long consultation progress, process. I, as from recollection, uh, following the election, we, we announced our policy prior to the election. Following the election, we published a consultation paper last August, sought feedback. We released legislation, I think, in December. Uh, we published a further and uh, detailed uh, paper along with draft rules in January. We have sought to engage deeply with civil society, with business, to deeply understand what the implications of this reform would be. And I'm not going to uh, provide information about the specifics of who met when, what when, because the truth is there has been an enormous amount of engagement right across the spectrum. And Senator Children, I do think that that is a good thing. It's how we should do policy. And I think that we are going to get a good result. I did promise earlier, turning to another matter, to um, provide advice to Senator Cash about the approach for lithium hydroxide producers. Um, and she asked me a very specific question. And I can advise the chamber that lithium hydroxide producers who enter the safeguard mechanism from the 1st of July 2023 will enter as new entrants, um, and the value, as a consequence, they will have new entrant baselines, and the value of those baselines will be set through consultation with industry and other stakeholders during 2023. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Well, it's uh, passing strange. The tonight at 8 o'clock, 8.45, we have seven Green senators in the chamber, happy to debate and take up opposition time, precious opposition time, to ask serious questions of the government about the deal that the Greens and the Labor Party reached on getting the safeguard mechanism through this parliament. And Senator Seal John, as he exits the Senate, Senator, takes up Senator McKenzie, you know that's out of order to refer to someone who's leaving the chamber. So the seven senators from the Greens party who were not here at nine o'clock last night, who were not here at midnight last night, who were not here at 3 a.m. and I know many of the Labor Party colleagues across the chamber understand the responsibility as parties of government to actually keep the chamber open keep the debate open and make sure that the Australian people's variety of views on legislation, no matter what the topic, are actually able to be expressed in a respectful manner. But the Greens political party was not here at 3.30 nor at 4.13 a.m. today, but Labor Party senators were, Liberal and National Party senators were, because we understand how important this chamber is to having a democratic debate about the legislation that our governments bring before this place. Yes. So for Senator Steele John to use precious opposition time in the committee phase, which is going to be truncated, to effectively deliver a second reading speech, which he could have done any time last night, like the rest of us. But you know what? No, no. It's uh, the lazy approach, the lazy accomplices, I'm going to call them, to the government's agenda. The lazy accomplices is the uh, Greens political party. They drop in when it's convenient. They drop the bombs, Senator. <laughs> um, and you know what? 
they roll on out. And I just really, this, we have so many questions, particularly um, those of us that are interested in the resources industry, that are interested in the safeguard mechanisms, impact on rural and regional communities, our industries, knowing that of the 215 uh, companies that are going to be impacted by this mechanism, we seriously want to understand, given that 84 per cent of them are in the regions, they're not, they are not in Fitzroy, they're not in inner city Brisbane, they're not in inner city Sydney, they are in the communities that we've been sent here to represent, and we're just doing our job by asking the government what the impacts will be, given that 84 per cent of the impact will be against our employers in our communities. Um, I would respectfully request the Greens to use the opportunities available to them to stay up like, like the rest of us, fulfil your dem democratic duties like the rest of us, uh, instead of using up time that could be used to actually ask the questions from not the inner cities, uh, but from outer suburban and regional communities that are trying to understand the implications and impost uh, of this deal that you've done on their future. So, Minister, um, understanding that modelling has been done, and I understand it has been done by EY, I understand it has been done by EY, um, was EY charged with modelling the impact on each individual sector impacted by the safeguard mechanism? Minister. Uh, Chair, while the, while the Senator McKenzie, do you have a, seek the call again? I do, because the call. in the efficiencies of time, um, was EY charged with modelling the impact on each individual sector? Was this done at an enterprise level? Because surely that will be the only way the government can ascertain the impact in specific geographic regions. Um, and did the government rely on financial data collected at a corporate level to work out the impact on each facility? And I would appreciate those sort of three questions would go to the same answer. Minister. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Uh, I have canvassed some of these same kinds of questions with Senator Macdonald and others. Um, EY was engaged to undertake some modelling work or some analysis, it might be more accurately characterised, um, and I believe that that is listed on Austender. Uh, I need to seek advice about what can be said about that. Um, like much of the work, uh, it was engaged in the context of a cabinet decision-making process. Um, I'm really not sure what I can say to you about this at this point in time, and I'd be, I'm not comfortable uh, providing advice without taking advice. Senator McKenzie. Um, Minister, are you seeking public interest immunity? Because this is quite a simple question, and the committee stage in the Senate for us is to actually ascertain what is the impact on our communities that you know you won the war, um, away you go. But we need to actually understand what genuine. Um, assessment the government's done to understand the impact of their decision making on our communities and our industries. Now, I'm very concerned if A, that wasn't detailed analysis, B, if that didn't go to the facility level, or C, didn't actually consult with enterprises themselves. That we've all got the list, we've all got the database, we know the 215. Um, that what is going to be the impact of that? And did you rely on financial data collected at the corporate level to work out the impact? And, and I'm, 
if the departmental officials in front of you don't un, um, have that information available to them, um, I, I would find that very, very concerning, given the potential impact that this legislation will have on our communities. Minister. Uh, thank you. Senator McKenzie, I, I think I've provided an answer. Um, the fact of the analysis and that EY was engaged to do analysis and work is, is public, as you know. Uh, the content of that um, fed into a decision of government through the cabinet processes, and I'm not at liberty to disclose it to you. Senator so, McKenzie. Are you telling the Senate that you don't understand the impact of your legislation on our communities, on our regions and on our industries? Minister. Senator, that question doesn't follow from the advice that I've provided to you. It doesn't make sense as a conclusion, and you shouldn't draw such a conclusion from the advice I've provided. <laughs> Senator it's McKenzie. actually the only conclusion I can draw, Minister, that you are prepared to stand up in the Australian Senate on an evening when the deal's been done, it's passing, and all we are seeking to do, Senator Canavan, Senator Macdonald, uh, Senator Dunningham, those of us that have risen throughout the day to seek an intelligent and informed understanding of the impact. And I hear the Greens laughing because they don't represent Gladstone, they don't represent Rockhampton, Moorumbah, they do not uh, they do not represent the Order. Latrobe Valley, they do Order. not represent the Alcoa. I'm sorry. Senator you don't. McKenzie. They don't vote Senator for McKenzie, you. resume uh, your seat. Green senators will respect the standing orders and not interject when a senator is on her feet speaking. Senator McKenzie, you have the call. Thank you, Chair. So it is only unless you are seeking public interest immunity over this information. This is precisely the forum that we are justified in asking these questions. You are putting this legislation forward, it will become law. Where else do we actually get these answers from? We know EY can, did the modelling. We want to understand whether you understood that from a facility level, whether you understood it from a geographic place level, that you actually understood. You talk about Cabinet, going to Cabinet, was Cabinet informed of the impact at a very local granular level of this legislation? If it wasn't, fine. If it was, what is it? Because you're asking the Senate to make a decision tonight on this legislation. But you, without that level of information, you're asking us to do that blindly. And you, have, you either have to claim public interest immunity or tell us what EY said, or you didn't bother asking. Minister. Senator McKenzie, I'm just was sitting here thinking about. Uh, racking my brain trying to think of the occasion when members from the previous government uh, stood in this, in this spot here in the chamber and shared uh, details about cabinet consideration. I was just trying to think when did that happen and the answer is on absolutely no occasion did that happen because that's not how cabinet government works. Um, Senator McKenzie, I will take on notice your request but it is entirely usual for cabinet material not to be disclosed. I appreciate that. Senator McKenzie. Minister, <laughs> I appreciate cabinet material, but impact of government decision making shouldn't be. Has a policy impact analysis been conducted on the government's deal with the Greens, noting only the Prime Minister can exempt a government entity from the need to complete impact analysis, and only then in very limited circumstances? The South Australian Chamber of Mines and Energy, with major members such as BHP Santos Beach Energy, has said as part of the last-minute deal between the Albanese uh, government and the Greens that um, that will force new gas projects to be net zero from day one. Why is the government imposing an immediate net zero obligation on energy sources needed to support the transition? Minister. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, there were two questions, I think, there. The first was in relation to regulatory impact assessment, and I have answered this question already in response to questions, I think, from Senator Macdonald, um, and I don't have anything further to add to that. Um, the second question related to the um, arrangements that are 
proposed to be put in place for um, some new entrants uh, associated with LNG production. Um, as I've explained uh, on many occasions throughout the debate, um, the government engaged in an extended period of consultation in preparing the material before the chamber. Um, it began last year and it has involved many, many workshops, roundtables, meetings, submissions. It's involved a Senate hearing. It's also been discussed at estimates. Uh, it's been a very extended discussion with a very wide range of people and I think the policy process was the better for it. Um, in relation to the approach to new gas, um, I can advise you, Senator Mackenzie, and I have discussed this already, that um, new gas fields supplying existing liquefied natural gas facilities will be treated as new facilities so that they are given international best practice baselines for the carbon dioxide in their new fields. Um, for these new fields, reservoir CO2 emissions, best practice is zero, given the existence of low CO2 fields and opportunities for carbon capture and storage. Senator Mackenzie. The EM states the bill will have no financial impact on the budget other than the remuneration of the Reduction Assurance Committee Chair. Why hasn't the cost of acquiring ACCUs to implement the price cap being considered given the government will be required to flood the market with ACCUs if the cap price is reached. Minister. Yes, uh, there's an existing budget allocation for um, the safeguard. Oh, sorry, my apologies, the Powering the Regions Fund, um, which uh, may be used for the purchase of um, ACCUs. Senator McKenzie. The Greens claims to have secured a pollution trigger in the Safeguard Mechanism Bill. What section of the bill establishes that pollution trigger? How will it work? What assessment has been undertaken to determine the impact on the viability of projects that are already in the pipeline? Minister. Will you give me a moment, Chair, while I just find the best paper, piece of paper to answer this in the most succinct and accurate way? Um, Senator Mackenzie, I have already answered this, um, which is why I was trying to find um, the piece of paper I relied upon the last time so that I provide consistent information to the chamber. But essentially, um, there will be a. It's set out in the explanatory memorandum, um, and essentially, um, the intention of the change is to ensure that the Minister, the Climate Change Secretary and the Climate Change Authority have the necessary information about designated large facilities that may increase their scope one emissions or new facilities that may become designated large facilities and can appropriately monitor the impact of the achievement of the revised object of the INGAS. Essentially, Senator Mackenzie, the object of the INGAS Act sets out or will set out the obligation to reduce emissions. Where the Minister for the Environment makes an approval that um, increases the emissions of a covered a safeguard facility, a notification obligation arises um, to the Secretary of the Department, the Climate Change Authority and the Minister. Um, obligations then attach to the Secretary of the Department and the Climate Change Authority uh, to assess whether that information suggests that the objects of the Act may not be met, and if that is the case, they need to advise the minister, and the minister needs to put in, uh, put in place a process to assess what steps, if any, need to be taken in response to that. As I indicated to Senator O'Sullivan when he asked me this same question, uh, it does not provide the ability for the Minister for Climate Change to um, 
cancel or in any way change the approval that has been provided under a separate act by a separate minister. Senator McKenzie. On, uh, given the UK government is spending $2 billion a year each year for the next 20 years to encourage companies to adopt new low emissions technology, and given the US Biden government is spending even more to help its industries to engage in new technology, such as carbon capture usage and storage, why is Australia's only strategy to engage in a national act of limbo? This is not a technology. Uh, that your government or the Greens is keen on promoting. This is proven technology that is working on 30 projects around the world with more than 100 under development, reducing emissions by 40 million tonnes or one-tenth of Australia's emissions. Is the Australian government opposed to this technology that is recognised uh, globally as one of the technologies that will help the globe reduce emissions and get to net zero, including nuclear technologies. I'm not asking about nuclear. Will CCUS technology be available to ports that are exporting Australian product, as is being done in large European ports such as Rotterdam? Minister. Senator, no, thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator McKenzie, the point of this bill is to create uh, material incentives for covered facilities to make investments to reduce their emissions. And it may well be that uh, the consequence of that is that people will choose to invest in CCUS. Senator McKenzie. And finally, Minister, last night when we were here to the wee hours talking about <sighs> your recovery fund and Senator Farrell, Minister Farrell stood here and asked us not to conflate this particular deal with the Greens with the desire to manufacture and um, build a manufacturing industry in, the Australia, in Australia, which your fund seeks to do. I find it passing strange that whilst today we are passing legislation that will impact on significant employers, particularly in rural and regional Australia, that the government has failed in my question. And I apologise if you've answered Senator Macdonald or answered Senator Brockman or answered Senator Canavan with jobs lost, jobs impact, the impact of the 84 per cent uh, of the 215 companies impacted. But for the brief period I've had an opportunity as leader of the Nationals in this place to question the government. What have you done to assess the impact on my people, my communities, my industries? And you have failed to answer very basic questions. You give us nothing to go back to our communities to understand the impact of Canberra on their place. It's not a lot to ask. It's a heavy responsibility that you've been given by the Australian people to the privilege to govern. But you have to govern for all of us, and you have to make the tough decisions, and that's your mandate, and you will do the deals that you will do. But you also need to be able to explain to the rest of us that don't live in Fitzroy, that don't live in inner city Brisbane, Perth, Sydney or Melbourne, of the impact of your decisions. And I've been very concerned about the giggles from the Greens when we've asked serious questions about working class families in our places, simple questions, and unable to give responses. Um, we clearly won't be supporting the bill, but, and it's also simultaneously disappointing that we couldn't get simple answers to quite simple questions. Minister. Yeah, I do note Senator Mackenzie's comments. It has been an extended committee stage, and through the course of the discussion, we have canvassed the consultation arrangements, the analysis that's been undertaken, the level of support that has been provided by a very broad range of business organisations uh, to establish. The, the arrangements for Australian businesses to remain competitive in a world that is decarbonising. 
Uh, and Senator McKenzie, I do note your views. Uh, I can assure you that this government takes very seriously the opportunity to support rural and regional communities. It's something that's important to me and it's important to the government. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Chair. I just thought I'd quickly, briefly um, just correct the record there of the minister. She mentioned there that wells decarbonise. I think it's absolutely not. Uh, carbon emissions are increasing and are set to hit record levels uh, because other countries are not doing what we're doing and they're actually investing in their energy security. As I mentioned earlier, the Biden administration opening up massive amounts of Alaska for oil drilling. The UK is doing the same uh, in the North Sea. The German Greens Party are reopening 24 coal fired power stations uh, right now as we speak. Uh, and of course, China is building 104 gigawatts of coal just this coal-fired power just this year. That's that's roughly two coal-fired power stations a week. So, in the time it takes us to uh, debate uh, through these two chambers this bill and pass it, uh, little old China will have built two <laughs> coal-fired power stations and uh, completely undermined what we're doing here. But be that as it may, I, I wanted to get some detailed questions, uh, Minister, uh, through you, Chair. Um, in particular, this question of new entrants, uh, which I think is, is key in, in discussions I've been having with uh, concerned uh, companies and investors in the past couple of days since the Labor Party's deal with the Greens. There's a lot of concern about how new entrants will or won't be treated. There's not a lot of clarity in the government's uh, uh, media release or Minister Bowen's media release. Um, uh, I, I asked the other day in the Senate uh, about the specific case, which I might ask again. You've got advisers now, and like question time, might better help you out. I asked about it, the specific case of the Olive Downs coal mine. I didn't get an answer uh, from Minister Farrell, although I'm not Robinson Crusoe. So, uh, in that regard, um, so the Olive Downs coal mine, just to explain, Minister, is a, a mine uh, in central Queensland, or going to be a mine near Moranbah. It's under construction right now. Uh, it's got all of its approvals, of course. Uh, there are 500 people working at that mine right now. Uh, however, it's not on the uh, safeguard mechanisms list. It's not one of the 215 facilities because it's not an operating mine yet. Uh, that will, will happen. It will go onto that list sometime uh, in the next couple of years. Will it be treated as a new entrant? Uh, and, and if so, um, what will its baseline be set at? Uh, uh, obviously, the investors here in this mine have done so on the basis of certain decisions, and uh, I don't want to reveal the conversations I've had, but it would be news to them if they were considered to be a new entrant. So will the Olive Downs mine be treated uh, as a new entrant, and, and what will their baseline uh, be? Uh, uh, can you give any certainty to the 500 people working at that mine this evening about their futures? Minister. Thanks, Senator Canavan. Um, so as I understand it from the description you've provided, uh, this mine is not currently covered by the safeguard mechanism because it's not operating, it's under construction. Um, I'm reluctant to make a specific assessment, but in general terms, um, an entity that um, commences production and trips the 100,000 um, tonne uh, uh, the threshold. Sorry, I am um, losing my words. Uh, the threshold uh, would then, you know, be be considered a safeguard, a covered facility. New entrants will be required to comply with best practice standards from the first day of operation, and those standards are going to be developed over the course of this year in consultation with industry. Senator Canavan. Amazing that uh, the, the government, again, I can refer back to my comments earlier, that the government that pretends to be in favour of workers' rights and support workers can't, can't give any certainty to 500 people employed today. This is, this is not people in the future. Uh, it's not a prospective thing. They're actually working there today. And I'm happy to give you the call, Minister, when I conclude. But uh, you've confirmed there for us, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you've confirmed that this, this mine will be treated as a new entrant. Uh, as I say, I think that might be news. Uh, to the company itself, so clearly there hasn't been a lot of consultation uh, from the government. They felt, given they've got all their approvals and been through an EPBC process, uh, they're probably the most uh, assessed mine proposal ever, probably in the world, the way we go about these things. Uh, so I think they'll be quite disappointed in that answer. Um, and, and as I say, no guarantees then about futures there from this government. I mean, the key thing here, the key thing here, 
uh, will be this, this, the, the way this hard cap works that um, at least uh, uh, Mr Bant describes and what is contributing to the uncertainty and confusion out there among investors is the big gap between how Mr Bant describes the deal, the sellout, if you like, uh, and how Mr Bowen describes it. Uh, Mr Bant has clear language that's easily interpreted. Mr Bowen has a bunch of bureaucraties which no one can really uh, navigate. Uh, so uh, I draw you to Mr Bant's media release where he says a hard cap or ceiling on actual or absolute gross emissions which won't be able to exceed current pollution levels, that is 140 million tonnes per annum, and there will be a decreasing cap over time. Um, in the government's own position paper they say, and I quote on page two uh, for the safeguard mechanism, that a reserve would be built into the overall emissions constraint and applied equally to all facilities to ensure the 2030 target will be met. The reserve accounts, this is a key thing, the reserve accounts for higher than expected production growth from existing and new facilities and trade exposed baseline adjustments. My question now is, is now the amount of this reserve that the government has flagged, is that amount now fixed given the agreement with uh, Mr Bant and the Greens? That is, uh, will uh, the government not entertain any change to the amount of the reserve between now and 2030? And, and also, what is the reserve? How much how much is the reserve in million tonnes, in, in million tonnes of carbon emissions? How much is this reserve? Minister. Senator, perhaps I can answer it from the other direction um, because I, I have answered, I have previously over the course of the afternoon answered this question from diff in different ways to different senators. But, um, Senator Kevin Canavan, I am engaging with your questions in good faith. Yeah. Okay. Well, let, so, uh, Senator Canavan, the amendments before the chamber um, establish a cap, an overall cap between now and 2030. Uh, for emissions for covered facilities, and, that's a, and that cap is established by applying the 43 per cent um, reduction uh, threshold to the covered facilities, including some estimates about increases in production activity. Um, that cap is uh, in the legislation, and it is established as a net cap. Um, so it accounts for the offsets and that have been the subject of quite a deal of discussion in recent times. Um, the objects proposed for the INGERS Act also establishes a requirement that the gross emissions decrease over time um, and it establishes a methodology by which that decrease, uh, a metric by which that decrease uh, would be assessed. Senator Canavan. Yeah, look, thanks, Chair. I'm still searching this answer, and even if it had answered before, I had been answered before. It's um, just a figure, Minister. All I'm asking for is how much is the reserve. I draw you to Mr. Bowen's media release on the uh, deal with the Labor Party. Uh, There's a deal between the Labor Party and the Greens. Uh, he says that, uh, and I quote, to not exceed the, the, the agreement is to not exceed the conservatively estimated 1,233 million tonnes of CO2 to 2030. Uh, I think that's the figure you were wanting there for the, 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 the overall cap of emissions. My question, though, is not that figure. Obviously, a component of the 1233 will be emissions by existing and possibly, if you've, we ever saw this modelling, possibly some new entrants. But obviously, in other uh, communications, Mr Bowen has um, mentioned uh, that there will be a reserve and what I'm asking is, there is a reserve, sorry, not will be, there is a reserve, and you've got a specific figure for 1233. Uh, Mr. Minister Bowen has said there's a reserve within that 1233 to account for new entrants, that is new investment that we kind of need in Australia, especially in the energy space. My, my specific, simple question is how much is that reserve? How much of the 1233 is set aside for growth from, from new entrants? How much? Minister. 
Uh, thanks, Senator Canavan. Um, we're not in a position to provide that express reserve at this point, and um, the reason for that is because, in, as a consequence of consultation with um, industry, uh, part of the things that are before the chamber uh, that have been discussed over the course of the day are some of the changes around um, the treatment of, of the manufacturing sector, and so we are simply working through those questions. Senator Canavan. Hey, it's quite remarkable, Chair, that um, we're sitting here debating this and, and, and the government, I know, has been mouthing sweet nothings to, to companies concerned about this issue, uh, saying, oh, look, it's all right, we've, we've got a reserve, it'll be fine, there'll be growth. I was just talking to some people at Aussies just before about this. They're desperately trying to get information that they can't get from your own minister or the government, but uh, they're being told Oh, as a reserve, it's okay. But you can't even tell us how much is in that reserve. It could be ten, could be five, could be a hundred. Uh, is it enough to even account for or, or accommodate the uh, Olive Downs mine uh, and or any others? So you won't give me or the Australian people the figure of the reserve. I'll put aside that for now. I might come back to it, but I'll put aside it for now. What happens? My question now is: What happens if the reserve is empty? So what happens if uh, we do get uh, other mines? Mitch, other senators have spoken of lithium mines, others that exceed the 100,000 tonne threshold, and they come into the system and they're given this best practice algorithm, the best practice formula. Uh, they obviously have a positive carbon emission impact. That uses up some of this reserve. What happens when the reserve gets to zero and, say, an Olive Downs comes along, it's already approved, wants to come along? If the reserve is already at zero at that point, if the reserve is empty and, and there's a proposal, it doesn't have to be a coal mine, but there's a proposal for a, another facility to come in or want to invest in Australia and they, uh, they, they, need, they, need, they need to be able to uh, get, uh, get uh, approval, get, get accredited through the safeguard mechanism, will they have to offset all their emissions? So if you, just, just to explain this question. So if the reserve's at zero and a new entrant comes in, will they have to then, if there's no reserve, it doesn't matter what the best practice is, it doesn't matter what uh, the formula you want to create, to get under your cap, which you're saying is a hard cap of, in legislation now, of one, two, three, three million tonnes, to get under that one, two, three, three million tonnes, they will have to offset all of their emissions and be, um, and be uh, net zero from day one. So I'm uh, happy for you to uh, mention, happy to point out where I'm going wrong here with this, but that seems to be the government's proposal because there's no flexibility in the cap. Minister. Uh, Senator Canavan, thanks for the question, and I appreciate it's a serious question, and I'm happy to assist. Um, so you've been speaking about a reserve, and it's true that a reserve was incorporated into the um, calculations to accommodate uncertainty. However, the calculations also included projections about new entrants. The reserve was an additional um, feature on top of that, and the new entrants, uh, the projections around emissions from new entrants, are derived from the emissions projections that are produced each year by the department that I think you would be familiar with. Um, Nonetheless, you asked what would happen under the circumstances where um, the minister was notified that there was a, a new proposal, uh, a new approval for a new facility of any kind um, that would imply that it would be likely that the fixed caps would not be able to be, not be able to be met, that the objects of the act would not be able to be met. The consequence of that circumstance would be for the minister to undertake a consultation about the rules as a whole. Um, it would not be for the minister to engage or impose requirements on a particular project. I hope that assists. Senator Canavan. Chair, I'll, I'll come back to that. There's a lot of questions from that answer, and I do appreciate it. It helps a lot. Um, just going back to this. Um, I thought I remember this, and I brought it up. This um, the reserve figure. Um, there's an article here. 
on the 7th of March on the ABC website, Chris Brown challenges Parliament to accept safeguard mechanisms or risk losing chance to cut emissions. It's the title of it. <clears throat> and uh, later on in the article, Mr Bowen is quoted saying, we've factored in a reserve of 17 million tonnes to cater for what we need. Is Mr Bowen right? Is the reserve 17 million tonnes? Minister. As I indicated to you in my earlier answer, as a consequence of the consultations that we have been taking place since the publication in January of the draft rules, we are proposing uh, a different treatment of the manufacturing sector, and that has some consequences for the reserve, and we're working through that. Senator Cannon. So the reserves are moving feast at the moment. We've got, we've got, this doesn't add up. Like, something doesn't add up here. We've got a hard cap. Uh, we've got a reserve. We've got a, a growth uh, factor as well for new entrants. They've all got to add up to one, two, three, three, because you're saying that is the cap in the legislation. One, two, three, three, and, and now you're saying, oh no, we've changed the 17 million tonnes. Now, Mr. Bowen was happy to tell the ABC that the reserve was 17 million tonnes. You must have a figure right now because your cap is one, two, three, three. What is the figure of the reserve tonight? Has it changed from that? If it's changed from 17 million tonnes, please tell us. But Mr. Bowen already told the public this. So there's no public interest immunity here. There's no cabinet issues. He told the ABC. Uh, what the reserve was. So, what is the reserve in your calculations tonight? You must have a spreadsheet back there that adds up to one, two, three, three. What is the figure for the reserve, Minister? Senator Canavan, I've explained to you that um, the reserve also includes um, the arrangements, the concessional arrangements that are put in place for some of the trade-exposed industries. I've also explained to you that. There, ha there is a proposal to shift that as a consequence of uh, consultation with the manufacturing sector. Um, you would expect our government to take a keen interest in representations from the manufacturing sector. Uh, we've made it clear that under certain circumstances the uh, baseline decline expected of some manufacturing entities uh, may be less than it would otherwise have been under the proposal circulated in January, and we were working through the consequences of that uh, in, in, in the way that you have requested. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I just think it is it's very um, uh, germane at this point to just point out that the government's reserve, and we haven't heard otherwise, maybe it's shifted a bit from 7 million tonnes, but it seems like as good a figure as any. Uh, Mr Bowen's confirmed that in the media. And, even if there has been a shift, it's probably a few million tonnes here or there. But 70 million tonnes of 1,233 million tonnes, so that's the overall cap for the next seven years. That's our budget, our carbon budget. We're stuck to for manufacturing, for mining, for transport in this country. We can't do more than that. This is a cap on economic growth. Like, let's be clear what the government has confirmed tonight. It's a cap on Australia's economic prosperity. It's a cap on our economic growth. It's a cap on our ability to make things and manufacture things in this country because we can't exceed this cap. <laughs> it's, gonna, it's in law. They're going to put it in law. It's, it's, it's stuck. Now, OK, to give them their due, the government's put some reserve in it. They put a, they've been very generous. They put a reserve for, to account for some growth. Well, 17 million tonnes of 1233, three, guess what that works at? 1.3%. We can grow 1.3 per cent over the next seven years. <laughs> How good is that? <laughs> How good is that? We would like to. You'd think we'd like to grow economic growth. You'd like it to be, I don't know, somewhere around three, four. If you know, you'd like to. You'd sort of hope and pray uh, that we can offer the Australian people increasing uh, real wages and living standards over time. Remember, keep in mind, if we don't grow as an economy, your real wages won't go up, your living standards won't go up, things will get more expensive, and you won't get paid more. And the government's saying is now. Now, the only thing you can expect is a 1.3 per cent increase in your living standards over seven years. Seven years. This was a mob that came to power saying they're going to make your life easier. They're going to cut power prices. They're going to increase real wages. And here tonight, they're putting in a cap on your living standards, a cap on what you can afford. And we've had that confirmed tonight by the minister. Unless you can say otherwise, unless you can tell us what the other figure is here, it is 17 million tonnes of 1.2 billion. That's 1.3 per cent. Over seven, not 1.3 per cent a year, by the way. It's 1.3 per cent for seven years, so let's just work that out. Uh, let's work that out. It's 1.3 per cent over seven years. Uh, the, growth over, the growth per year is the whole 0.18 per cent. <laughs> Every year you can grow by, you can get, your life can get better by 0.18 per cent. So if you're earning 100 grand at the moment, 
you're earning a hundred grand. Um, you, you can, you can, you thank your lucky stars, and you will get a pay increase of. Let me just work this out. I don't use this calculator very often. Uh, I should be able to do this in my head, but you know, I'm getting old. Um, so you'll get a pay increase of eighteen dollars. <laughs> <laughs> you can look forward to under this under this hard cap eighteen dollars a year eighteen dollars a year you'll get a pay increase yeah don't spend it all at once that's my bit. don't spend it all at once it's just eighteen dollars that's what they're doing to us that's what they're doing it's a hard cap on our economic growth that's what they've just admitted here in this place and so I, I want to go back though minister the, the first answer well, not first but one of the answers you gave me was quite revealing you mentioned We've got a reserve, which we won't tell you, can't tell you. Mr. Bowen could tell the ABC, but he can't tell you can't tell a parliament how much this reserve is, but it's about seven million tons. You also mentioned you, you're, um, you've got a growth factor in there for new entrants. You're already projecting some new entrants over the next seven years. Um, my question is, how much is that? You've obviously done that work. You've admitted you've done the calculations. So how much in your calculations have you factored in? For, new en for, for emissions from new entrants until 2030, under that 1233 cap. How much is that figure? Minister. Senator Canavan, many of the things. Oh, sorry, my apologies, Chair. May I have no, the call? No, you have the call, yeah. Minister. Uh, Senator Canavan, the projections that are generated to 2030 include new entrants, but also growth in existing production, um, and the total volume without an intervention um, to 2030 is 1,017 megatons. Um, senators. We are scheduled to um, sit again tomorrow and deal with this same matter. Uh, and accordingly, I move that the committee have leave to sit again. Uh, I move that the committee report order, progress order on my and left. seat leave to sit again. So the question is, the minister has sought leave to sit tomorrow. Do you also seek leave for the committee to report, Minister? Yes, I, I move that the committee report progress and seek leave to sit again. So the question is that the committee report progress and seek leave to sit again tomorrow. Those that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. I think the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells. Four minutes.
Lock the doors. Question before the chair that the committee report progress. Those for the question move to the right of the chair. Nose to left of the chair. I point as teller for the eyes, Senator Shikoni, and teller for the nose, Senator O'Sullivan. Honourable Senators, there being 29 ayes and 26 noes, it is resolved in the affirmative. The committee has considered the safeguard mechanism crediting Amendment Bill 2023 and has made progress and seeks leave to sit again. Minister. Oh, sorry. Senator Birmingham. Oh, let the government. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. We have leave to sit again on the next day of sitting and move that the question be now called. Right. I put the order. Order. I put the question. Those the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
No, the sand. Lock the doors. So the question is that the question be put. Those of that opinion shall move to the right uh, and the no shall move to the left. Order. I appoint Senator Ciccone as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the noes. Order. There being 29 ayes and 26 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Uh, I'm now going to move the motion. You moved before Senator Wong. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Wong that the committee have leave to sit again on the next day of sitting be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I'm, I move that the Senate do now adjourn. So the question is, the motion is moved by the Minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Order on my left. Lock the doors. So the question is order. Order across the chamber. So the question is the motion is moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Giacconi as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the left.
Order. There being 29 ayes and 26 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9 a.m.